Ballet by Alexander Kuprin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anne Fletcher, Hobart, 2019. Allez! This jerky, exclamatory order was Mademoiselle Nora's earliest memory from the dark monotony of her erring childhood. This word, allez, was the very first that her weak, childish little tongue ever framed, and always, even in her dreams, this cry reproduced itself in Nora's memory, evoking in its five letters the chill of the unheated circus ring, the smell of stables, and the heavy gallop of the horse, the dry crackling of the long whip, and the burning pain of its lash suddenly deadening the momentary hesitation of fear. Allez! In the empty circus it is cold and dark. Here and there the wintry sunlight, scarcely piercing the glass cupolas, lies in pale spots over the raspberry-coloured velvet and the gilt of the boxes, over the shields with the horses' heads, over the flags that decorate the pillars. It plays on the dim glasses of the electric globes, gliding over the steel of the tourniquets and trapezes, up there at a tremendous height amid the entanglement of the machines and the ropes, from which one can scarcely distinguish the first rows of the stalls, and the seats behind and the gallery are completely drowned in darkness. The day's routine is in full swing. Five or six of the performers, in great coats and fur caps, are smoking rank cigars at the end of the first row of armchairs near the entrance from the stables. In the middle of the ring stands a square-built, short-legged man with a tall hat perched on the back of his head and a black moustache carefully twisted to a fine point at the ends. He is tying a long string round the waist of a tiny little five-year-old girl, who is standing in front of him shivering from fright and cold. The big white horse, which a stableman leads around the ring, snorts loudly shaking its arched neck as the white steam gushes from its nostrils. Every time that it passes the man in the tall hat, the horse looks askance at the whip that sticks out under his arm, snorts with agitation, and, plodding round, drags the tugging stable-boy behind it. Little Nora can hear behind her back its nervous plunges, and she shivers still more. Two powerful hands seize her round the waist and lightly toss her onto the large leather mattress on the horse's back. Almost at the same instant, the chairs, the white pillars, the tent cloth hangings at the entrance, all this is merged into the bizarre circle which spins round to meet the horse. In vain her numb hands clutch convulsively at the rough wave of mane as her eyes close tightly, blinded by the devilish flash of the seething circle. The man in the tall hat walks in the centre of the ring, holding in front of the horse's head the end of his long whip, which he cracks deafeningly. Allez! And again. She is in her short gauze skirt, with her bare, thin, half-childish arms, standing in the electric light beneath the very cupola of the circus on a well-balanced trapeze. From this, at the little girl's feet, there is hanging, head downwards, his knees clutching the upright post, another square-built man, in pink tights with gold spangles and fringe, curled, pomaded and cruel. Now he has raised his lowered hands, spread them out, and fixing Nora's eyes with that penetrating, meaning look, the hypnotising glance of the acrobat, he claps his hands. Nora makes a quick forward movement with the intention of hurling herself straight down into those strong, pitiless hands. Oh, what a thrill it will give the hundreds of spectators! But all of a sudden her heart grows cold, seems to stop from terror, and she only squeezes more tightly the thin ropes of the trapeze. Up go once more the cruel, bent hands, and the acrobat's glance becomes still more intense. Beneath her feet the space seems that of an abyss. Allez! Again, she balances, scarcely able to breathe, on the very apex of the living pyramid. She glides, wriggling with her body, supple as a serpent's, between the cross beams of the long white ladder which a man is holding on his head. She turns a somersault in the air, thrown up by the feet of the jongleur, strong and terrible like steel springs. Again, 
at a great height she walks on thin trembling wire which cuts her feet unbearably and everywhere are the same dim beautiful faces the pomaded heads the puffed curls the moustaches upturned the reek of cigars and perspiration and always that inevitable fatal cry the same for human beings for horses and for performing dogs allez she was just sixteen and a very pretty girl when during a performance she fell from the airy tourniquet past the net on to the sand of the ring she was picked up unconscious and taken behind the scenes where in accordance with circus traditions they began to shake her by the shoulders with all their might to bring her back to herself she awoke to consciousness groaning with pain from her crushed hand the audience is getting restless and beginning to go they were saying around her come show yourself to the public obediently her lips framed the usual smile the smile of the graceful horsewoman but after walking two steps the pain became unbearable and she cried out and staggered then dozens of hands laid hold of her and pushed her forcibly in front of the public Allez! during this season there was working in the circus a certain star clown named menotti he was not the ordinary pauper clown who rolls in the sand to the rhythm of slaps in the face and who manages on a quite empty stomach to amuse the public for a whole evening with inexhaustible jokes menotti was a clown celebrity the first solo clown and imitator on the planet a well-known trainer who had received innumerable honours and prizes he wore on his breast a heavy chain of gold medals received two hundred roubles for a single turn and boasted of the fact that for the last five years he had worn nothing but moire costumes after the performances he invariably felt done up and with a highfalutin bitterness would say of himself yes we are buffoons we must amuse the well-fed public in the arena he would sing pretentiously and out of tune old couplets or recite verses of his own composition or make gags on the duma or the drainage which usually produced on the public drawn to the circus by reckless advertising the impression of insistent dull and unnecessary contortions in private life he had a languidly patronising manner and he loved with a mysterious and negligent air to insinuate his conquests of extraordinarily beautiful extraordinarily rich but utterly tiresome countesses at her first appearance at the morning rehearsal after her sprain had been cured menotti came up to her held her hand in his made moist tired eyes at her and asked in a weakened voice about her health she became confused blushed and took her hand away that moment decided her fate a week later as he escorted nora back from the evening performance menotti asked her to have supper with him at the magnificent hotel where the world-famous first solo clown always stopped the cabinet particulier are on the first floor and as she made her way up nora stopped for a minute partly from fatigue and partly from the emotion of the last virginal hesitation but menotti squeezed her elbow tightly in his voice there rang fierce animal passion and with it the cruel order of the old acrobat as he whispered allez and she went she saw in him an extraordinary a superior being almost a god she would have gone into fire if it had occurred to him to order it for a year she followed him from town to town she took care of menotti's brilliance and jewels during his appearances put on and took off for him his tricot attended to his wardrobe helped him to train rats and pigs rubbed his face with cold cream and what was most important of all believed with idolizing intensity in his world fame when they were alone he had nothing to say to her and he accepted her passionate caresses with the exaggerated boredom of a man who though thoroughly satiated mercifully permits women to adore him after a year he had had enough of her 
his attention was diverted to one of the sisters wilson who were executing airy flights he did not stand on ceremony with nora now and often in the dressing-room right in front of the performers and stablemen he would box her ears for a missing button she bore all this with the humility of an old clever and devoted dog who accepts the blows of his master finally one night after a performance in which the first trainer in the world had been hissed for whipping a dog really too savagely Minotti told nora straight out to go immediately to the devil she left him but stopped at the very door of the room and glanced back with a begging look in her eyes then Minotti rushed to the door flung it open furiously and shouted allez but only two days later like a dog who has been beaten and turned out she was drawn back again to the master a blackness came to her eyes when a waiter of the hotel said to her with an insolent grin you cannot go up he is in a cabinet particulier with a lady but nora went up and stopped unerringly before the door of the very room where she had been with menotti a year ago yes he was there she recognised the languid voice of the overworked celebrity, interrupted from time to time by the happy laugh of the red-haired Englishwoman. Nora opened the door abruptly. The purple and gold tapestries, the dazzling light of the two candelabras, the glistening of crystals, the pyramid of fruit and bottles in silver buckets, Minotti lying on the sofa in his shirt-sleeves, and Wilson with her corsage loosened, the reek of scent, wine, cigars and powder, all this at first stupefied her. Then she rushed at Wilson and struck her again and again in the face with her clenched fist. Wilson shrieked and the fight began. When Minotti had succeeded with difficulty in separating them, Nora threw herself on her knees, covered his boots with kisses and begged him to come back to her. Menotti could scarcely push her away from him, as he said, squeezing her neck tightly with his strong fingers, "'If you don't go at once, I'll have you thrown out of the place by the waiter!' Almost stifled, she rose to her feet and whispered, oh, oh, in, "'In that case, in that case!' Her eyes fell on the open window. Quickly and lightly, like the experienced gymnast she was, she bounded on to the sill and bent forward, her hands grasping on each side the framework of the window. Far down beneath her the carriages rattled, seeming from that height mere small, strange animals. The pavements glistened after the rain, and the reflections of the street lamps danced about in the pools of water. Nora's fingers grew cold and her heart stopped beating for a second of terror. Then, closing her eyes and breathing heavily, she raised her hands above her head, and fighting down, as usual, her old weakness, she cried out, as if in the circus, Allez! End of Allez by Alexander Kuprin The Bad Old Woman in Black From Tales of Wonder by Lord Dunsinay This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman The Bad Old Woman in Black by Lord Dunsinay the bad old woman in black ran down the street of the ox butchers. Windows at once were opened high up in those crazy gables. Heads were thrust out. It was she. Then there arose the council of anxious voices calling sideways from window to window or across to opposite houses. Why was she there with her sequins and bugles and old black gowns? Why had she left her dreaded house? On what fell errand she hastened? They watched her lean, lithe figure, and the wind in the old black dress, and soon she was gone from the cobbled streets and under the town's high gate. 
she turned at once to her right and was hid from view of the houses then they all ran down to their doors and small groups formed on the pavement there they took counsel together the eldest speaking first of what they had seen they said nothing for there was no doubt it was she it was of the future they spoke and the future only in what notorious thing would her errand end what gains had tempted her out from her fearful home what brilliant but sinful scheme had her genius planned above all what future evil did this portent thus at first it was only questions and then the old greybeard spoke each one to a little group they had seen her out before had known her when she was younger had noted the evil things that had followed her goings the small groups listened well to their low and earnest voices no one asked questions now or guessed at her infamous errand but listened only to the wise old men who knew the things that had been and who told the younger men of the dooms that had come before nobody knew how many times she had left her dreaded house but the oldest recounted all the times that they knew and the way she had gone each time and the doom that had followed her going and two could remember the earthquake that there was in the street of the shearers so were there many tales of the times that were told on the pavement near the old green doors by the edge of the cobbled street and the experience that the aged men had bought with their white hairs might be had cheap by the young but from all their experience only this was clear that never twice in their lives had she done the same infamous thing and that the same calamity twice had never followed her goings therefore it seemed that means were doubtful and few for finding out what thing was about to befall and an ominous feeling of gloom came down on the street of the ox butchers and in the gloom grew fears of the very worst this comfort they only had when they put their fears into words that the doom that followed her goings had never yet been anticipated one feared that with magic she meant to move the moon and he would have dammed the high tide on the neighboring coast knowing that as the moon attracted the sea the sea must attract the moon and hoping by his device to humble her spells another would have fetched iron bars and clamped them across the street remembering the earthquake that was in the street of the shearers another would have honored his household gods the little cat-faced idols seated above his hearth gods to whom magic was no unusual thing and having paid their fees and honored them well would have put the whole case before them his scheme found favor with many and yet at last was rejected for others ran indoors and brought out their gods too to be honored till there was a herd of gods all seated there on the pavement yet would they have honored them and put their case before them but that a fat man ran up at last carefully holding under a reverent arm his own two hound-faced gods though he knew well as indeed all men must that they were notoriously at war with the little cat-faced idols and although the animosities natural to the faith had all been lulled by the crisis yet a look of anger had come into the cat-like faces that no one dared disrespect and all perceived that if they stayed a moment longer there would be flaming around them the jealousy of the gods so each man hastily took his idols home leaving the fat man insisting that his hound-faced gods should be honored then there were schemes again and voices raised in debate and many new dangers feared and new plans made but in the end they made no defense against danger 
for they knew not what it would be, but wrote upon a parchment as a warning, and in order that all might know. The bad old woman in black ran down the street of the ox butchers. The end of The Bad Old Woman in Black by Lord Dunsinay. Bliss by Catherine Mansfield. Read by Neslihan Stamboli. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bliss Although Bertha Young was thirty, she still had moments like this, when she wanted to run instead of walk, to take dancing steps on and off the pavement, to bowl a hoop, to throw something up in the air and catch it again, or to stand still and laugh at nothing, at nothing simply. What can you do if you're thirty and, turning the corner of your own street, you're overcome suddenly by a feeling of bliss, absolute bliss, as though you'd suddenly swallowed a bright piece of that late afternoon sun and it burned in your bosom, sending out a little shower of sparks into every particle, into every finger and toe. Oh, is there no way you can express it without being drunk and disorderly? How idiotic civilization is! Why be given a body if you have to keep it shut up in a case like a rare, rare fiddle? No, that about the fiddle is not quite what I mean, she thought, running up the steps and feeling in her bag for the key. She'd forgotten it as usual, and rattling the letterbox. It's not what I mean, because... Thank you, Mary. She went into the hall. Is nurse back? Yes, Mum. And has the fruit come? Yes, Mum, everything's come. Bring the fruit up to the dining room, will you? I'll arrange it before I go upstairs. It was dusky in the dining room and quite chilly. But all the same, Bertha threw off her coat. She could not bear the tight clasp of it another moment and the cold air fell on her arms. But in her bosom there was still that bright glowing place, that shower of little sparks coming from it. It was almost unbearable. She hardly dared to breathe for fear of fanning it higher, and yet she breathed it deeply, deeply. She hardly dared to look into the cold mirror. But she did look, and it gave her back a woman radiant, with smiling, trembling lips, with big, dark eyes, and an air of listening, waiting for something divine to happen, that she knew must happen, infallibly. Mary brought in the fruit on a tray, and with it a glass bowl and a blue dish, very lovely, with a strange sheen on it, as though it had been dipped in milk. Shall I turn on the light, Mum? No, thank you. I can see quite well. There were tangerines and apples stained with strawberry pink, some yellow pears, smooth as silk, some white grapes covered with a silver bloom and a big cluster of purple ones. These last she had bought to tone in with the new dining room carpet. Yes, that did sound rather far-fetched and absurd, but it was really why she had bought them. She had thought in the shop, I must have some purple ones to bring the carpet up to the table. And it had seemed quite sense at the time. When she had finished with them and had made two pyramids of these bright round shapes, she stood away from the table to get the effect. And it really was most curious, for the dark table seemed to melt into the dusky light and the glass dish and the blue bowl to float in the air. This, of course, in her present mood, was so incredibly beautiful. She began to laugh. No, no, I'm getting hysterical. And she seized her bag and coat and ran upstairs to the nursery. Nurse sat at a low table, giving little Bee her supper after her bath. The baby had on a white flannel gown and a blue woolen jacket 
and her dark, fine hair was brushed up into a funny little peak. She looked up when she saw her mother and began to jump. Now, my lovey, eat it up like a good girl, said Nurse, setting her lips in a way that Bertha knew, and that meant she had come into the nursery at another wrong moment. Has she been good, Nanny? She's been a little sweet all the afternoon, whispered Nanny. We went to the park and I sat down on a chair and took her out of the pram and a big dog came along and put its head on my knee and she clutched its ear, tugged it. Oh, you should have seen her. Bertha wanted to ask if it wasn't rather dangerous to let her clutch at the strange dog's ear, but she did not dare to. She stood watching them, her hands by her side, like the poor little girl in front of the rich little girl with the doll. The baby looked up at her again, stared, and then smiled so charmingly that Bertha couldn't help crying. Oh, Nanny, do let me finish giving her her supper while you put the bath things away. Well, Mum, she oughtn't to be changed hands while she's eating, said Nanny, still whispering. It unsettles her. It's very likely to upset her. How absurd it was. Why have a baby if it has to be kept, not in a case like a rare, rare fiddle, but in another woman's arms? Oh, I must, said she. Very offended, Nanny handed her over. Now don't excite her after her supper. You know you do, Mum, and I have such a time with her after. Thank heaven. Nanny went out of the room with the bath towels. Now I've got you to myself, my little precious, said Bertha as the baby leaned against her. She ate delightfully, holding up her lips for a spoon and then waving her hands. Sometimes she wouldn't let the spoon go, and sometimes, just as Bertha had filled it, she waved it away to the four winds. When the soup was finished, Bertha turned round to the fire. You're nice, you're very nice, said she, kissing her warm baby. I'm fond of you, I like you. And indeed she loved little Bee so much, her neck as she bent forward her exquisite toes as they shone transparent in the firelight, that all her feeling of bliss came back again, and again she didn't know how to express it, what to do with it. You're wanted on the telephone, said Nanny, coming back in triumph and seizing her little bee. Down she flew, it was Harry. Oh, is that you, Burr? Look here, I'll be late. Uh, I'll take a taxi and come along as quickly as I can, but get dinner put back ten minutes, will you? All right? Yes, perfectly. Oh, Harry? Yes? What had she to say? She'd nothing to say. She only wanted to get in touch with him for a moment. She couldn't absurdly cry, Hasn't it been a divine day? What is it? rapped out the little voice. Nothing, entendu, said Bertha, and hung up the receiver, thinking how more than idiotic civilization was. They had people coming to dinner, the Norman Knights, a very sound couple. He was about to start a theatre, and she was awfully keen on interior decoration. A young man, Eddie Warren, who had just published a little book of poems, and whom everybody was asking to dine, and a find of Bertha's called Pearl Fulton. What Miss Fulton did, Bertha did not know. They had met at the club and Bertha had fallen in love with her, as she always did fall in love with beautiful women who had something strange about them. The provoking thing was that, though they had been about together and met a number of times and really talked, Bertha couldn't yet make her out. Up to a certain point, Miss Fulton was rarely wonderfully frank, but the certain point was there, and beyond that she would not go. Was there anything beyond it? Harry said no, voted her dullish and cold like old blonde women, with a touch, perhaps, of anemia of the brain. But Bertha wouldn't agree with him, not yet, at any rate. No, the way she has of sitting with her head a little on one side, 
and smiling has something behind it, Harry, and I must find out what that something is. Most likely it's a good stomach, answered Harry. He made a point of catching Bertha's heels with replies of that kind. Liver frozen, my dear girl, or pure flatulence, or kidney disease, and so on. For some strange reason, Bertha liked this and almost admired it in him very much. She went into the drawing room and lighted the fire, then, picking up the cushions one by one that Mary had disposed so carefully, she threw them back onto the chairs and the couches. That made all the difference. The room came alive at once. As she was about to throw the last one, she surprised herself by suddenly hugging it to her, passionately, passionately. But it did not put out the fire in her bosom. Oh, on the contrary. The windows of the drawing room opened onto a balcony overlooking the garden. At the far end, against the wall, there was a tall, slender pear tree in fullest, richest bloom. It stood perfect, as though becalmed against the jade-green sky. Bertha couldn't help feeling, even from this distance, that it had not a single bud or a faded petal. Down below, in the garden beds, the red and yellow tulips, heavy with flowers, seemed to lean upon the dusk. A grey cat, dragging its belly, crept across the lawn, and a black one, its shadow, trailed after. The sight of them, so intent and so quick, gave Bertha a curious shiver. What creepy things cats are, she stammered, and she turned away from the window and began walking up and down. How strong the jonquil smelled in the warm room. Too strong? Oh, no. And yet, as though overcome, she flung down on a couch and pressed her hands to her eyes. I'm too happy, too happy, she murmured. And she seemed to see on her eyelids the lovely pear tree with its wide open blossoms as a symbol of her own life. Really, really she had everything. She was young, Harry and she were as much in love as ever, and they got on together splendidly and were really good pals. She had an adorable baby. They didn't have to worry about money. They had this absolutely satisfactory house and garden. And friends, modern, thrilling friends, writers and painters and poets or people keen on social questions, just the kind of friends they wanted. And then there were books and there was music, and she had found a wonderful little dressmaker, and they were going abroad in the summer, and their new cook made the most superb omelettes. I'm absurd, absurd, she sat up, but she felt quite dizzy, quite drunk. It must have been the spring. Yes, it was the spring. Now she was so tired she could not drag herself upstairs to dress. A white dress, a string of jade beads, green shoes and stockings. It wasn't intentional. She had thought of the scheme hours before she stood at the drawing room window. Her petals rustled softly into the hall, and she kissed Mrs. Norman Knight, who was taking off the most amusing orange coat with a procession of black monkeys round the hem and up the fronts. Why, why, why is the middle class so stodgy, so utterly without a sense of humour? My dear, it's only by a fluke that I'm here at all, Norman being the protective fluke, for my darling monkey so upset the train that it rose to a man and simply ate me with its eyes. Didn't laugh, wasn't amused, that I should have loved. No, just stared and bored me through and through. But the cream of it was, said Norman, pressing a large tortoise-shell-rimmed monocle into his eye, you don't mind me telling this face, do you? In their home and among their friends, they called each other face and mug. The cream of it was when she, being full-fed, turned to the woman beside her and said, haven't you ever seen a monkey before? Oh, yes, 
Mrs. Norman Knight joined in the laughter. Wasn't that too absolutely creamy? And the funniest thing still was that now her coat was off, she did look like a very intelligent monkey who had even made that yellow silk dress out of scraped banana skins and her amber earrings, they were like little dangling nuts. This is a sad, sad fall, said Mug, pausing in front of Little Bee's perambulator. When the perambulator comes into the hall, and he waved the rest of the quotation away, the bell rang. It was lean, pale Eddie Warren, as usual, in a state of acute distress. It is the right house, isn't it? he pleaded. Oh, I think so. I hope so, said Bertha brightly. I have had such a dreadful experience with a taxi man. He was most sinister. I couldn't get him to stop. The more I knocked and called, the faster he went. And in the moonlight, this bizarre figure with the flattened head crouching over the little wheel. He shuddered, taking off an immense white silk scarf. Bertha noticed that his socks were white too. Most charming. But how dreadful, she cried. Yes, it really was, said Eddie, following her into the drawing room. I saw myself driving through eternity in a timeless taxi. He knew the Norman Knights. In fact, he was going to write a play for N.K. when the theatre scheme came off. Well, Warren, how's the play? said Norman Knight, dropping his monocle and giving his eye a moment in which to rise to the surface before it was screwed down again. And Mrs. Norman Knight. Oh, Mr. Warren, what happy socks. I'm so glad you like them, said he, staring at his feet. They seem to have got so much whiter since the moon rose. And he turned his lean, sorrowful young face to Bertha. There is a moon, you know. She wanted to cry. I'm sure there is, often, often. He really was a most attractive person, but so was Face, crouched before the fire in her banana skins, and so was Mug, smoking a cigarette and saying, as he flicked the ash, Why doth the bridegroom tarry? There he is now. Bang went the front door, open and shut. Harry shouted, Hello, you people, down in five minutes and they heard him swarm up the stairs. Bertha couldn't help smiling. She knew how he loved doing things at high pressure. What, after all, did an extra five minutes matter? But he would pretend to himself that they mattered beyond measure, and then he would make a great point of coming into the drawing room, extravagantly cool and collected. Harry had such a zest for life. Oh, how she appreciated it in him and his passion for fighting, for seeking in everything that came up against him another test of his power and of his courage. That, too, she understood, even when it made him just occasionally, to other people who didn't know him well, a little ridiculous, perhaps. For there were moments when he rushed into battle where no battle was. She talked and laughed and positively forgot until he had come in, just as she had imagined, that Pearl Fulton had not turned up. I wonder if Miss Fulton has forgotten. I expect so, said Harry. Is she on the phone? Ah, there's a taxi now. And Bertha smiled with that little air of proprietorship that she always assumed while her women finds were new and mysterious. She lives in taxis. She'll run to fat if she does, said Harry coolly, ringing the bell for dinner. Frightful danger for blonde women. Harry, don't, warned Bertha, laughing up at him. Came another tiny moment while they waited, laughing and talking, just a trifle too much at their ease, a trifle too unaware. And then Miss Fulton, all in silver, with a silver fillet binding her pale blonde hair, came in smiling, her head a little on one side. Am I late? 
No, not at all, said Bertha. Come along. And she took her arm and they moved into the dining room. What was there in the touch of that cool arm that could fan, fan, start blazing, blazing the fire of bliss that Bertha did not know what to do with? Miss Fulton did not look at her, but then she seldom did look at people directly. Her heavy eyelids lay upon her eyes, and the strange half-smile came and went upon her lips as though she lived by listening rather than seeing. But Bertha knew suddenly, as if the longest, most intimate look had passed between them, as if they had said to each other, You too? That Pearl Fulton, stirring the beautiful red soup in the grey plate, was feeling just what she was feeling. And the others? Faith and Mug, Eddie and Harry, their spoons rising and falling, dabbing their lips with their napkins, crumbling bread, fiddling with the forks and glasses, and talking. I met her at the Alpha Show, the weirdest little person. She'd not only cut off her hair, but she seemed to have taken a dreadfully good snip off her legs and arms and her neck and her poor little nose as well. Isn't she very lié with Michael Oat? The man who wrote Love and False Teeth? He wants to write a play for me. One act, one man, decides to commit suicide, gives all the reasons why he should and why he shouldn't. And just as he has made up his mind either to do it or not to do it, curtain. Not half a bad idea. What's he going to call it? Stomach trouble? I think I've come across the same idea in a little French review, quite unknown in England. No, they didn't share it. They were dears, dears, and she loved having them there at her table and giving them delicious food and wine. In fact, she longed to tell them how delightful they were and what a decorative group they made, how they seemed to set one another off and how they reminded her of a play by Chekhov. Harry was enjoying his dinner. It was part of his, well, not his nature exactly, uh, and certainly not his pose, his uh, something or other to talk about food and to glory in his shameless passion for the white flesh of the lobster and the green of pistachio ices, green and cold like the eyelids of Egyptian dancers. When he looked up at her and said, Bertha, this is a very admirable souffle, she almost could have wept with childlike pleasure. Oh, why did she feel so tender towards the whole world tonight? Everything was good, was right. All that happened seemed to fill again her brimming cup of bliss. And still, in the back of her mind, there was the pear tree. It would be silver now in the light of poor dear Eddie's moon, silver as Miss Fulton who sat there turning a tangerine in her slender fingers that were so pale a light seemed to come from them. What she simply couldn't make out, what was miraculous, was how she should have guessed Miss Fulton's mood so exactly and so instantly. For she never doubted for a moment that she was right. And yet, what had she to go on? Less than nothing. I believe this does happen very, very rarely between women. Never between men, thought Bertha. But while I'm making the coffee in the drawing room, perhaps she will give a sign. What she meant by that, she did not know. And what would happen after that, she could not imagine. While she thought like this, she saw herself talking and laughing. She had to talk because of her desire to laugh. I must laugh or die. But when she noticed Face's funny little habit of tucking something down the front of her bodice, as if she kept a tiny secret hoard of nuts there too, Bertha had to dig her nails into her hands so as not to laugh too much. It was over at last, and come and see my new coffee machine, said Bertha. 
We only have a new coffee machine once a fortnight, said Harry. Faith took her arm this time. Miss Fulton bent her head and followed after. The fire had died down in the drawing room to a red, flickering nest of baby phoenixes, said Faith. Don't turn up the light for a moment. It's so lovely. And now she crouched by the fire again. She was always cold. Without her little red flannel jacket, of course, thought Bertha. At that moment, Miss Fulton gave the sign. Have you a garden? said the cool, sleepy voice. This was so exquisite on her part that all Bertha could do was to obey. She crossed the room, pulled the curtains apart, and opened those long windows. There, she breathed, and the two women stood side by side looking at the slender, flowering tree. Although it was so still, it seemed like the flame of a candle to stretch up, to point, to quiver in the bright air, to grow taller and taller as they gazed, almost to touch the rim of the round silver moon. How long did they stand there? Both, as it were, caught in that circle of unearthly light, understanding each other perfectly, creatures of another world, and wondering what they were to do in this one with all this blissful treasure that burned in their bosoms and dropped in silver flowers from their hair and hands. Forever, for a moment, and did Miss Fulton murmur, Yes, just that. Or did Bertha dream it? Then the light was snapped on, and Face made the coffee, and Harry said, My dear Mrs. Knight, don't ask me about my baby. I never see her. I shan't feel the slightest interest in her until she has a lover. And Mug took his eye out of the conservatory for a moment, and then put it on the glass again, and Eddie Warren drank his coffee and set down the cup with a face of anguish as though he had drunk and seen the spider. What I want to do is to give the young man a show. I believe London is simply teeming with first chop, unwritten plays. What I want to say to them is, here's the theatre, fire ahead. You know, my dear, I'm going to decorate a room for the Jacob Nathans. I'm so tempted to do a fried fish scheme with the backs of the chairs shaped like frying pans and lovely chipped potatoes embroidered all over the curtains. The trouble with our young writing man is that they're still too romantic. You can't put out to sea without being seasick and wanting a basin. Well, why won't they have the courage of those basins? A dreadful poem about a girl who was violated by a beggar without a nose in a little wood. Miss Fulton sank into the lowest, deepest chair, and Harry handed round the cigarettes. From the way he stood in front of her, shaking the silver box and saying abruptly, Egyptian, Turkish, Virginian, they're all mixed up, Bertha realized that she not only bored him, he really disliked her. And she decided from the way Miss Fulton said, No, thank you, I won't smoke, that she felt it too and was hurt. Oh, Harry, don't dislike her. You're quite wrong about her. She's wonderful, wonderful. And besides, how can you feel so differently about someone who means so much to me? I shall try to tell you when we're in bed tonight what has been happening, what she and I have shared. At those last words, something strange and almost terrifying darted into Bertha's mind, and this something blind and smiling whispered to her, Soon these people will go. The house will be quiet. Quiet. The lights will be out, and you and he will be alone together in the dark room, the warm bed. She jumped up from her chair and ran over to the piano. What a pity someone does not play, she cried. What a pity somebody does not play. For the first time in her life, Bertha Young desired her husband. Oh, she loved him. 
She'd been in love with him, of course, in every other way, but just not in that way. And equally, of course, she'd understood that he was different. They'd discussed it so often. It had worried her dreadfully at first to find that she was so cold. But after a time, it had not seemed to matter. They were so frank with each other, such good pals. That was the best of being modern. But now, ardently, ardently, the word ached in her ardent body. Was this what that feeling of bliss had been leading up to? But then, then, my dear, said Mrs. Norman Knight, you know our shame. We're the victims of time and train. We live in Hampstead. It's been so nice. I'll come with you into the hall, said Bertha. I loved having you, but you must not miss the last train. That's so awful, isn't it? Have a whiskey, Knight, before you go, called Harry. No thanks, old chap. Bertha squeezed his hand for that as she shook it. Good night. Goodbye, she cried from the top step feeling that this self of hers was taking leave of them forever. When she got back into the drawing room, the others were on the move. Then you can come part of the way in my taxi. I shall be so thankful not to have to face another drive alone after my dreadful experience. You can get a taxi at the rank just at the end of the street. You won't have to walk more than a few yards. That's a comfort. I'll go and put on my coat. Miss Fulton moved towards the hall and Bertha was following when Harry almost pushed past. Let me help you. Bertha knew that he was repenting his rudeness. She let him go. What a boy he was in some ways. So impulsive. So simple. And Eddie and she were left by the fire. I wonder if you have seen Bilk's new poem called Tabdot, said Eddie softly. It's so wonderful. In the last anthology, have you got a copy? I'd so like to show it to you. It begins with an incredibly beautiful line. Why must it always be tomato soup? Yes, said Bertha, and she moved noiselessly to a table opposite the drawing room door, and Eddie glided noiselessly after her. She picked up the little book and gave it to him. They had not made a sound. While he looked it up, she turned her head towards the hall, and she saw Harry with Miss Fulton's coat in his arms, and Miss Fulton with her back turned to him, and her head bent. He tossed the coat away, put his hands on her shoulders, and turned her violently to him. His lips said, I adore you and Miss Fulton laid her moonbeam fingers on his cheeks and smiled her sleepy smile. Harry's nostrils quivered, his lips curled back in a hideous grin while he whispered, Tomorrow. And with her eyelids, Miss Fulton said, Yes. Here it is, said Eddie. Why must it always be tomato soup? It's so deeply true, don't you feel? Tomato soup is so dreadfully eternal. If you prefer, said Harry's voice, very loud, from the hall, I can phone you a cab to come to the door. Oh no, it's not necessary, said Miss Fulton, and she came up to Bertha and gave her the slender fingers to hold. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Goodbye, said Bertha. Miss Fulton held her hand a moment longer. Your lovely pear tree, she murmured. And then she was gone, with Eddie following, like the black cat following the grey cat. I'll shut up shop, said Harry, extravagantly cool and collected. Your lovely pear tree, pear tree, pear tree. Bertha simply ran over to the long windows. What's going to happen now? she cried. But the pear tree was as lovely as ever and as full of flower and as still. End of Bliss by Catherine Mansfield 
Read by Neslihan Stamboli The Compulsory Diversion, An Old Baron's Yarn by Mor Yokai Read by Neslihan Stamboli This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Compulsory Diversion, An Old Baron's Yarn I wonder, my dear fellows, if any of you know the Countess Stefan Repay, the younger one, I mean, not the old lady, that little Creole princess, my little black-eyed kobold, as I call her. Mine, indeed. <laughs> I don't mean that, of course. That is only a façon de parler. All of us, my dear fellows, as you very well know, have sighed after her enough, at some time or other. But none of you have had, like me, the luck to travel at night with her in the same coach. Well, naturally, her maid was there too. Still, it was a great bit of luck all the same. But no more of such luck for me, thank you. One day, at her castle of Karekvar, it suddenly occurred to the countess, quite late in the evening, that the casino ball at Arad was coming off on the morrow, and she must be there at all hazards. No sooner said than done. The horses were put to at once, and, as there was nobody with her but me, she said, I pray you, my dear Baron, be so good as to escort me to Arad. Well, when it came to, dear Baron, what on earth could I say? Countess, my dear, it is very dark. We shall only get upset and break our legs. And how can we dance with broken legs? We shall have to cross the three Kurish rivers. The bridge over one of them is sure to be crazy as usual. And in we shall plump. Then at Salenta we shall have to pass through the deuce of a wood, full of robbers. And I shall never be able to defend you single-handed against the whole lot of them. And besides... What need is there to hurry? Early tomorrow morning, after a nice cup of tea, you have only to step into your carriage. Your four bay horses will fly with us to Arad, and by the evening you will be quite ready with your toilet. That's what I said. But you know how it always is. Try and persuade a woman not to do a thing, and she'll insist on doing it all the more. She didn't want to drive her horses to death, she said, and whoever heard of wanting to rest after a short journey like that? Besides, she loved so to travel by night. What with the stars and the frogs, it was so beautiful, so romantic, and much more such stuff. But bless you, that was a mere pretext. The fact was... She had suddenly got the idea into her darling little noddle, and nothing in heaven or earth could turn her from her purpose. Enfin, I was between two stools. I had either to go with her or remain alone in the castle. Of course, I chose the former alternative, especially after she gave me permission to sit opposite to her in the coach. I enjoyed myself splendidly, I can tell you. The Countess, by degrees, absolutely loaded me with her favours. First of all, she put her handbag in my lap, to which she presently added a muff. Next, she hung a reticule upon my arm. Finally, she entrusted to me a couple of bandboxes. After that, she fell asleep. I could have asked anything I liked of her especially when the coach stumbled and she awoke in terror and began asking for all her belongings one after another, dozing off again when she was quite sure they were all there. Later on, 
the lady's maid began to groan. Oh, Lord, how my head aches. Whereupon I also pretended to fall asleep. Suddenly we all started up in alarm. The coach had suddenly moved sideways and then come to a dead stop as if it had fallen into a ditch. My countess also awoke and asked stupidly what was the matter. The lackey leaped from the box and came to the carriage window. Your ladyship, I'm afraid we have lost our way. Well, what of that? said the countess. We can't stop here. There's a road in front of us, I suppose, and we're bound to arrive somewhere if we only follow it. Yes, but... Yes, but... What do you mean? The road must lead somewhere, I suppose. Saving your ladyship's presence, we're in the Salentar Wood. Well, the Salentar Wood is no trackless wilderness. We shall get to the end of it in a couple of hours. Yes, your ladyship, but the coachman is afraid. The coachman? What business has he to be afraid? There's nothing about that in his contract, is there? He's afraid of some mischief befalling your ladyship. What has the coachman to do with me, I should like to know? Here I thought it my duty to intervene. Countess, my dears, this is no joke. This comes, you see, of nocturnal excursions. Here we are, camping out in the middle of a forest, and the robbers who abound in this forest will come and take our horses, our money, and our lives. I only wish I had a revolver. But the little demon only laughed, and before I could prevent it, she had opened the coach door and leaped out. Oh, what a splendid night! How fragrant the forest is! How the glowworms sparkle in the grass! Have you no eyes, Baron? Eyes, indeed! when I couldn't see three paces before me for the darkness. But surely, I see something shining through the trees over there, she continued. My blood grew cold within me. We were approaching some robbers then, evidently. The coachman answered the question from his box with the voice of a man who was already being throttled. That, your ladyship, is the pothouse which the country people call a guest detaining charda. Guest detaining, bravo! The very thing for us. Let's hasten thither. I was desperate. For God's sake, Countess, what would you do? Why, that charda is a notorious resort of thieves where they would kill the whole lot of us, a regular murder hall whose landlord is hand in glove with all the ruffians of the district, and where numbers and numbers of people have come to an evil end. The naughty girl only laughed at me. She told me I had read all these horrors in the story books, and there was not a word of truth in any of them. She admitted, indeed, that if there had been another inn, she would have gone to that in preference. But as this was the only one, we had no choice. She then ordered the coachman to drive the horses along very gingerly while she went before on foot to show him the way. Every lamentation and objection was useless. We had to stumble along in the direction of that cursed charda, for she threatened to go alone if we were afraid to come too. It is a fact that that naughty little fairy was afraid of nothing, when we drew nearer to the charda, a merry hullabalooing sort of music suddenly struck upon our ears, though all the windows were closed by shutters. Mon Dieu, it's absolutely full of robberies. You see how it is, remarked the countess mischievously. We started to go to a ball, and at a ball we have arrived. No one, you see, can avoid his fate. And thereupon, with appalling foolhardiness, she marched straight towards the door. For a moment, I really thought I should have turned tail, left her there, and made a bolt of it. But noblesse oblige. And besides, I couldn't, for Mademoiselle Césarine, the lady's maid, 
had gripped my arm so tightly that I was powerless to release myself. The poor creature was more than half dead with fright. At any rate, she was only half alive when we followed the countess together. Even outside the door, we could hear quite distinctly the wild dance music and the merry uproar proceeding from a parcel of men inside. But my countess was not a bit put out by it. Boldly, she opened the door and stepped into the charda. It was a large, long, dirty, whitewashed room where, in my first terror, I could see about 50 men dancing about. Subsequently, when I was able to count them, there turned out to be only nine of them, including the landlord, who did not dance, and three gypsies who provided the music. But it seemed to me that five stalwart ruffians were quite enough to deal with our little party. They were all tall fellows who could easily hit the girders of the roof with their clenched fists, and strapping fellows too, with big, broad shoulders. Their five muskets were piled up together in a corner. Well, we were in a pretty tight place, it seemed to me. The rascals, when they saw us, instantly left off dancing and seemed to be amazed at our audacity. But my countess said to them with a charming smile, Forgive me, my friends, for interrupting your pastime. We have lost our way, and as we couldn't go any further in the dark, we have come here for shelter, if you will give it to us. At these words, one of the fellows, sprucer and slimmer a good deal than the others, gave his spiral moustache an extra twirl, took off his vagabond's hat, clapped his heels together, and made my countess a profound bow. He assured her she was not inconveniencing them in the least. On the contrary, they would be very glad of her society. I am the master here, he added. Yoji Fekete, the famous robber, by the way, at your ladyship's service. But who then is your ladyship? Before I could pull the countess's mantilla to prevent her from blurting out who she was, she had already replied. I am the Countess Repé from Kerekbar. Then I am indeed fortunate, said the rascal. I knew the old Count. He fired after me with a double musket on one occasion, though he did not hit me. Pray sit down, Countess. A pleasant introduction, I must say. The Countess sat down on a bench, the fellow beside her. Me? They didn't ask to take a seat at all. And where did your ladyship think of going on such a night? I winked at her. Don't tell him. We were going to Arad, to the casino ball. Adieu, all our jewels, I thought. Oh, then you have come here just at the nick of time. Your ladyship need not go a step further, for we're giving a ball here. If you do not despise our invitation... We have very good gypsy musicians, the Salenta band, you know. They can play splendid chardashes. The rascal didn't stand on ceremony in the least, but no sooner did they begin dashing off the chardash than he threw his buttoned dolman half over his shoulder and seizing the countess round the waist, twirled her off amidst a lot of them. Another fellow immediately hastened up to Mademoiselle Césarine and ravished her away in a half-fainting condition. But she had no need to think of herself, for she was passed from one hand to another, so that her feet never touched the ground. As for my countess, she excelled herself. She danced with as much fire and vivacity as if she were sweeping over the waxed floor of the assembly rooms at Arad. Never have I seen her so amiable, so charming, as she was at that moment. I have seen Hungarian dances at other times and have always been struck by their quaintness, but nobody ever showed me how much there was really in them as that good-for-nothing rascal showed me then. 
First of all, he paced majestically round with his partner, as if this were the proudest moment of his life, gazing haughtily down upon her from over his shoulder. Then he would shout down the music when at its loudest, and it was pretty loud too, and emerge from the midst of the throng after his partner. She, all the time, swaying modestly backwards and forwards before him, like a butterfly which touches every flower, but lights on none. And indeed, I am only speaking the truth when I say that her feet never seem to touch the earth. The fellow, foppishly enough, would keep bending towards her as if he were about to embrace her on the spot, and then would stop short, stamping with one foot and flinging back his head haughtily, alluring the enchanting little fairy hither and thither after him. Sometimes he would rush right after her, as if about to cast himself upon her bosom, and then, with a sudden twirl, would be far away from her again, and only the glances of their eyes showed that they were partners. Presently, as if in high dudgeon, he would turn away from his partner, plant himself right in front of the gypsy musicians, and prance furiously up and down before them and after thus dancing away his anger, suddenly pat her back to the countess, and seize and whirl her round and round, as if he were a hurricane, and she a leaping flame. During this spacious pastime, I was constantly agonized by the thought that perhaps this mad rogue, in his excitement, might permit himself some unbecoming demonstration towards the countess. The temptation, you know, was great. The countess was entirely in his power. The fellow was a gallows bird, with the noose half round his neck already. An extra misdeed or two, more or less, could do him no further harm. I was firmly resolved that if he insulted the countess by the least familiarity, I would make a rush for the piled-up muskets, seize one of them, and shoot the villainous trifler dead. I affirm on my honour that this I was firmly resolved to do. But there was no necessity for it. The dancers finished the three dances, the robber chief politely conducted his partner back to her place and respectfully kissed her hand after thanking her heartily for her kindness. And with that, he approached me, and amicably tapping me on the shoulder, inquired, Well, old chap, can't you dance? Fancy calling me old chap. Thank you, I said. I cannot. More's the pity. And back he went to the countess. I beg your ladyship's pardon, he began, for not being sufficiently prepared for the reception of such distinguished guests but I hope you will indulgently accept what we have to offer you. It is not much, but it is good. So he meant to give us not only the bowl, but the supper after it. And a splendid banquet it was, I must say. A large cauldron full of stewed calf's flesh was produced, put upon the long table, and we all took our places round it. Of plates and dishes, there was no trace. Everyone used his own claws, by which I mean to say that, with a hunk of bread in one hand and a clasp knife in the other, we fished up our marrow bones from the cauldron itself. As for my countess, she fell to as if she had been starving for three days. The rubber chief fished up for her, with his brass-studded clasp knife, the reddest morsels of flesh, they literally swam in pepper, and piled them up on her white roll. It was something splendid, I can tell you. Suddenly it occurred to the rascal that I was not eating. Fall to, old chap, said he. Stalling goods make the fattest dishes, you know. Nice company, eh? Thank you. I can't eat it. It's too much peppered, I said. All right. So much the more for us. 
The wine, naturally, was sent round in the flask. Not a glass was to be seen. Yoji Fekete, as is the way with boars, first drank from the flask himself, and then, having wiped the mouth of it with his wide shirt sleeve, presented it to the countess. And bless my heart, she took it and drank out of it. An amazing woman, really. Then the flippant rogue turned to me and offered me a drink. Come, drink away, old chap, he said. Why always harp upon my grey hairs? For of course you are going to make a night of it. Thank you, I cannot drink. I'm a Tito Taylor, I said. I was now thoroughly convinced that they were going to drink themselves mad drunk, preparatory to knocking our brains out. And indeed, they did drink a cask of wine between the five of them, yet when they rose from the table, not one of them so much as staggered. While they were treating the gypsies, the robber chief approached me again. Well, old chap, devil take him with his old chap. So you neither eat, nor drink, nor dance, eh? How then do you amuse yourself? Do you play cards? And with that, he produced a pack from his pocket. So he wanted to find out how much money I had in my pocket, eh? I know no game at cards. Well, I'll pretty soon teach you one. It's quite easy. Look, now, I put one card here and another card there. You lay upon this and I lay upon that. And whichever of us draws a court card of the corresponding suit takes the stake. The rascal was actually teaching me Landsknecht and I was obliged to pretend to learn from him. What could I do? I was obliged to sit down and play with him. I had in my pocket a lot of coppers. I thought I might as well risk them, so I put them on the table. What? We don't play for browns here. We're not bumpkins. Here's the bank. And with that, he flung upon the table a whole heap of silver florins and gold ducats. I also had a few small silver coins in my purse, and with much fear and trembling, I placed one of them on the first card. He dealt out, and I won the stake. The rascal paid up. Not for the world would I have taken up the money. I left it where it was. A second, and a third time I won. Again, I did not gather my stakes. The fourth, Fifth, sixth time, every time, in fact, fortune smiled on me. I began to perspire. It is a frightful situation when a man plays cards with a scoundrel and wins his money continually. The seventh stake also was mine. By this time, a whole army of silver coins stood before me. A cold sweat began to trickle down my temples. Why couldn't I be as lucky as this at Pressburg, at the club, during the session of the diet? Again, I staked the whole lot, inwardly praying that I might lose it all. In vain, for the eighth time, I won. I was a doomed man. There could be no doubt about it. The rascal smiled and said, Well, old chap, you cannot very well be in love with the pretty countess, for you win at cards so shamefully. The rascal even dared to chaff me. I trembled in every limb when the night deal began. Yes, sure enough, again it fell to my share. The robber struck the table with his fist and laughed aloud. Well, old chap, he cried. If you go on winning like this, I shall lose the whole county of Bihar in an hour's time. And with that, he pocketed what money remained and raised from the table. I took my courage in both hands and ventured to offer him the money I had won. The fellow looked me up and down as haughtily as a hidalgo. What do you take me for? said he. Pick up your winnings at once, or I'll pitch you and them out of doors. Good heavens, 
What was I to do with all this money? Money enough to be murdered for. And I had no doubt they would beat me to death for it presently. I took it all and gave it to the gypsy musicians. And only after I had done it did I reflect what a foolish thing it was to do. For how could I more clearly have betrayed the fact that I was indeed a man of unlimited means? The silly gypsies thereupon gathered round me and insisted upon playing me an air. What was my favourite air? they asked. I got out of it by referring them to the countess. I told them to play her favourite air, and she would accompany it with her voice. The countess certainly did not require much pressing. She began to sing with her delightful siren voice. Summer and winter, the pusta is my dwelling. And so sweetly, so enchantingly did she sing, that I quite forgot my surroundings and fancied I was in a private box at the Budapest Casino. I actually began to applaud. The robber chief also applauded. And now, he said, he would teach the countess his favorite song. And then the madcap rascal roared out some rustic melody, which certainly I had never heard before. Well, old chap, he said when he had finished. It is now your turn to sing us something. I was in a terrible pother. I sing? I sing in that hour of mortal anguish? I, who didn't know a single note except home, sweet home? I can't sing at all, I said. And that wicked, frivolous woman began laughing at me frightfully as involuntarily I fell humming an air from some opera. I may mention I have a horrible, hoarse sort of voice, not unlike a peacock's. If you won't sing, she said to me in French, we shall all be insulted, see, if we don't. What could I do? With the dart of terror in my heart and the pressure of mortal fear in my throat, I piped forth my home, sweet home. I felt all along I was making a woeful mess of it. Up to the middle of the song, the countess behaved with great decorum, but just as I was working my way up to the most pathetic part and brought out a most cruel flourish, she burst out laughing, and the whole band of robbers began to laugh with her, till at last I also was obliged to smile, though, oddly enough, there was no joke in it at all, as far as I could see. Then they fell to dancing again. The countess was indefatigable. And so it went on till broad daylight. When the sun shone through the windows, she said to the robber how obliged she was for the entertainment. But enough was as good as a feast, and would he, therefore, put to the horses and let us be off. Well, now at last... We shall all be knocked on the head straightway, I thought. The robber went out, hunted up the coachman and the lackey, gave the necessary orders, and came back to say the carriage was awaiting us. No doubt they meant to shoot us down on the road. I got into the carriage far more alarmed than I was when I got out of it. It was a suspicious circumstance that he did not separate me from my companion. Evidently, they intended to make sure of us and murder us altogether. The rascal himself took horse, galloped along by the side of our carriage, and conducted us to the turnpike road so as to put us on our way. Then he raised his cap, wished us a merry evening, and galloped back again. Only when we came to Zerind did I venture to believe that I was alive. Only then did I begin to reproach the Countess for involving us in an adventure which might have ended miserably enough. Suppose, I said, these rascals had not been afraid of me. Why, then they might have practiced all sorts of sorties upon her, and then 
to dance with vagabonds in a charda till dawn of day. Unpardonable. All the way to Arad, I was indulging myself with the hope that if I was very civil to the countess, she would not give me away by revealing the secret of this disreputable adventure. At six o'clock we reached Arad, and as we dismounted at the door of the reception room, she told three of my acquaintances what had befallen us. Of course, everyone speedily knew of our misadventure, so I was not even able to tell the story my own way. And again, she was the loveliest woman at the ball, and she knew it, and that was one of the chief reasons why she came. It is true she did not dance a step. She excused herself by saying she was tired to death. I can well believe it. From midnight to dawn she had danced nineteen chardashes, why, I, who hadn't danced at all, could hardly stand on my legs. As for me, I hastened to the card room. Now that fortune has embraced you, hug her tight, I thought to myself. At one table they were playing Landsknecht. Now's your time, make a plunge, I said to myself. But I had the most cursed luck. I lost a thousand florins straight off. Fortune, evidently, only pursues you when she sees that you're afraid of her. Six months later, I came across a newspaper in which was an account of the summary conviction and execution by hanging of the famous robber chief Yoji. I took the newspaper to the Countess Stefan Repay and showed it to her. Fancy, she said, when she had read the case through. And such a good dancer as he was, too. End of The Compulsory Diversion, An Old Baron's Yarn by Moor Yokai Read by Nislihan Stamboli A Dinner Date with Murder by Harry Stein this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. A Dinner Date with Murder by Harry Stein. It was long past the dinner hour and too early for the after theater crowd. The two men at the table near the door were the only patrons in Luigi's restaurant. They had eaten and were sitting there drinking wine. They drank very slowly, and it was plain that they were waiting for somebody because they weren't talking much and had the half-bored, half-impatient look of people who have nothing to do but wait. At the table near the back of the room, the waiter, who seemed to be the only one on duty, sat smoking a black twisted cigar and reading a newspaper one of the men put his wine glass down and lit a cigarette even sitting down he was noticeably shorter than his companion but he was powerfully built he had a deep olive complexion and eyes that were black and sparkling it looks like your man isn't coming dan he said don't worry about it, Gaddy, Dan said. He'll turn up. He knows the trail's hot, and he'd rather be a live rat than a dead kidnapper. Gaddy shook his head slowly. I don't know, he said vaguely. You say you'll know if it's the same one that phoned. How can you be sure? The accent, it's unmistakable. A deep voice with an accent like a vaudeville dialectician's. Gaddy refilled their glasses from the green bottle on the table. Then they were silent. The front door opened and two men entered. One was fat, with a complexion the color of old weather-beaten brick, and eyes that were watery and cold. He wore a high-crowned pearl-gray fedora, set squarely on his head, and his fleecy coat had heavily padded shoulders. The other man was slight and sallow. 
his coat was too tight across his back and he walked with a defiant swagger they hung their hats and coats on the rack and sat down two tables away from the one at which dan and gaddy were sitting the waiter put down his cigar and came to their table bowing slightly spaghetti with the meat sauce the stout man ordered loudly on a bottle of chianti same the small man said laconically the waiter went off without a word the two men lit cigarettes dan and gaddy watched them with open curiosity waiting for some sign but they smoked in silence never looking in the direction of the other table it's the organ grinder accent all right gaddy said in a barely audible voice but where's the high sign give him a chance dan mumbled he has to be plenty careful i suppose the waiter came back in with a wicker wrapped bottle which he set on the table before the newcomers then he went back to the kitchen and when he returned he brought two heaping plates of spaghetti dripping reddish brown sauce and giving off a fragrant scent the idea is to talk on a full stomach i suppose gaddy whispered or isn't he the guy i thought your man was coming alone he didn't say dan said gaddy watched the fat red-faced man wheeling fork and knife eating the spaghetti with great relish that's a pretty good spaghetti eh joe the fat man said loudly right joe replied briefly dan looked toward the back of the room where the waiter was again occupied with his cigar and paper maybe they're waiting for the waiter to clear out first he was thinking he sipped his wine waiting then he looked up again the stout man had almost finished what was on his plate and was taking a long drink from his wine glass he put the glass down and sat back in his chair he turned his watery eyes on dan and nodded his head slowly up and down up and down dan glanced quickly at gaddy who had his elbow on the table and seemed to be sleepily leaning far over on one side of his chair then he nodded his head at the stout man just as the latter had done the next instant he was on the floor and somewhere over his head repeated claps of thunder were bursting as if they would never cease and from the other table he heard a choked scream his ears hurt in the silence that followed when he rose from the floor gaddy gun in hand was already standing at the side of the two men who a little while before had been enjoying their spaghetti and were now dead the waiter had disappeared dan took a revolver from the lifeless hand of the small sallow-faced man he looked at the chambers all the cartridges were neatly in place he never had a chance to use it gaddy explained the door opened again a man with his hat drawn down over his eyes stood in the doorway and looked wildly about at the dead men and at dan and gaddy then he turned around frantically our man gaddy cried he leapt forward grabbed the fleeing man by the elbow and jerked him violently into the room you want to see us gaddy said you phoned the lieutenant didn't you every feature of the man's face was distorted with terror gaddy shook him this is a lieutenant he said pointing to dan what were you going to tell him the man looked at the corpses in a slow steady gaze his face was more composed now sure he said in a deep resonant voice they are dead now yes i no have to be afraid yes that's right they're dead dan said where have they been keeping the kid the man drew a piece of paper from his pocket dan read the address on it and put it in his own pocket who are they he asked pointing at the bodies the man was calm now that's a rocky callahan he said and a little one he is a joe baker i was a gonna tell you i was a gonna how you say walk out on them 
Rocky Callahan from Detroit? Dan said in surprise. You mean the fat feller? That's all right. Sucker, Getty chuckled. Hey, Dan said dryly. But what started the target practice? He pulled a rod on us, Gaddy said. Who? Joe Baker, the little guy. I didn't see it. Sure, because you weren't looking for it. I was looking at them. Baker had it under the table in the hand he wasn't eating with. You couldn't notice unless you bent down to look under the flap of their tablecloth. They must have found out their pal here was going to sing and figured he probably told us too much already. They counted on getting him later. Dan nodded reflectively. But what I want to know, he said, is how you happen to be looking under their table. Gaddy chuckled some more. I was just making sure, he said. Guys named Callahan shouldn't try to eat spaghetti. He might have palmed off the accent, but nobody with a real accent like that would cut up his spaghetti with a knife and pick up little pieces on his fork. What's wrong with that? Dan wanted to know. Gaddy gave him a look of contempt. You eat spaghetti with a fork and a tablespoon to help you wind it around the fork, and you eat it full length, or it isn't worth eating. You damn are right, Gaddy's prisoner put in belligerently. His fear and humility were completely gone now. That's the only way to eat a him. The End of A Dinner Date with Murder by Harry Stein The Disciple by Oscar Wilde. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rob Marland. The Disciple. When Narcissus died, the trees and the flowers desired to weep for him. And the flowers said to the trees, let us go to the river and pray it to lend us of its waters, that we may make tears and weep and have our fill of sorrow. So the trees and the flowers went to the river, and the trees called to the river and said, We pray thee to lend us of thy waters, that we may make tears and weep and have our fill of sorrow. And the river answered, Surely ye may have of my waters as ye desire, but wherefore would ye turn my waters, which are waters of laughter, into waters that are waters of pain? And why do ye seek after sorrow? And the flowers answered, We seek after sorrow because Narcissus is dead. And when the river heard that Narcissus was dead, it changed from a river of water into a river of tears. And it cried out to the trees and the flowers and said, Though every drop of my waters is a tear, and I have changed from a river of water into a river of tears, and my waters that were waters of laughter are now waters of pain, yet can I not lend ye a tear, so loved I Narcissus. And the trees and the flowers were silent, and, after a time, the trees answered and said, We do not marvel that thou shouldst mourn for Narcissus in this manner, so beautiful was he. And the river said, But was Narcissus beautiful? And the trees and the flowers answered, Who should know that better than thou? Us did he ever pass by, but thee he sought for, and would lie on thy banks and look down at thee, and in the mirror of thy waters he would mirror his own beauty. And the river answered, But I loved Narcissus because... As he lay on my banks and looked down at me, in the mirror of his eyes I saw ever my own beauty mirrored. Therefore loved I Narcissus, and therefore must I weep and have my fill of sorrow, nor can I lend thee a tear. End of the Disciple by Oscar Wilde The Economical Pair by Carolyn Wells From The Wit and Humor of America in Ten Volumes, Volume 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. The Economical Pair by Carolyn Wells. Once upon a time there was a man and his wife who had different ideas concerning family expenditures. The man said, I am extremely economical, although I spend small sums here and there for cigars, wine, theater tickets, and little dinners. Yet I do not buy me a yacht or a villa at Newport. But even with these praiseworthy principles, it soon came about that the man was bankrupt. Whereupon he reproached his wife, who answered his accusations with surprise. Me? My dear, she exclaimed, why, I am exceedingly economical. True, I occasionally buy me a set of sables or a diamond tiara but i am scrupulously careful about small sums i diligently unknot all strings that come around parcels and save them and i use the backs of old envelopes for scribbling paper yet somehow my bank account is also exhausted morals this fable teaches to take care of the pence and the pounds will take care of themselves and that we should not be penny wise and pound foolish. The end of the economical pair by Carolyn Wells. Farewell by Guy de Maupassant, read by Neslihan Stamboli. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Farewell. The two friends were getting near the end of their dinner. Through the café windows they could see the boulevard crowded with people. They could feel the gentle breezes which are wafted over Paris on warm summer evenings and make you feel like going out somewhere you care not where, under the trees, and make you dream of moonlit rivers, of fireflies, and of larks. One of the two, Henri Simon, heaved a deep sigh and said, Ah, I'm growing old. It's sad. Formerly, on evenings like this, I felt full of life. Now I only feel regrets. Life is short. He was perhaps forty-five years old, very bald and already growing stout. The other, Pierre Carnier, a trifle older, but thin and lively, answered, Well, my boy, I've grown old without noticing it in the least. I've always been merry, healthy, vigorous and all the rest. As one sees oneself in the mirror every day, one does not realize the work of age, for it is slow, regular, and it modifies the countenance so gently that the changes are unnoticeable. It is for this reason alone that we do not die of sorrow after two or three years of excitement, for we cannot understand the alterations which time produces. In order to appreciate them, one would have to remain six months without seeing one's own face. Then, oh, what a shock! And the women, my friend, how I pity the poor beings. All their joy, all their power, all their life lies in their beauty, which lasts ten years. As I said, I aged without noticing it, I thought myself practically a youth when I was almost fifty years old. Not feeling the slightest infirmity, I went about happy and peaceful. The revelation of my decline came to me in a simple and terrible manner, which overwhelmed me for almost six months. Then I became resigned. Like all men, I have often been in love but most especially 
once. I met her at the seashore at Etreta about 12 years ago, shortly after the war. There's nothing prettier than this beach during the morning bathing hour. It is small, shaped like a horseshoe, framed by high white cliffs which are pierced by strange holes called the portes, one stretching out into the ocean like the leg of a giant, the other short and dumpy. The women gather on the narrow strip of sand in this frame of high rocks which they make into a gorgeous garden of beautiful gowns. The sun beats down on the shores, on the multicolored parasols, on the blue-green sea, and all is gay, delightful, smiling. You sit down at the edge of the water and you watch the bathers. The women come down wrapped in long bathrobes, which they throw off daintily when they reach the foamy edge of the rippling waves, and they run into the water with a rapid little step, stopping from time to time for a delightful little thrill from the cold water, a short gasp. Very few stand the test of the bath. It is there that they can be judged from the ankle to the throat. Especially on leaving the water are the defects revealed, although water is a powerful aid to flabby skin. The first time that I saw this young woman in the water, I was delighted, entranced. She stood the test well. There are faces whose charms appeal to you at first glance and delight you instantly. You seem to have found the woman whom you were born to love. I had that feeling and that shock. I was introduced and was soon smitten worse than I had ever been before. My heart longed for her. It is a terrible yet delightful thing thus to be dominated by a young woman. It is almost torture and yet infinite delight. Her look, her smile, her hair fluttering in the wind, the little lines of her face, the slightest movement of her features delighted me, upset me, entranced me. She had captured me, body and soul, by her gestures, her manners, even by her clothes, which seemed to take on a peculiar charm as soon as she wore them. I grew tender at the sight of her veil on some piece of furniture, her gloves thrown on a chair. Her gowns seemed to me inimitable. Nobody had hats like hers. She was married, but her husband came only on Saturday and left on Monday. I didn't concern myself about him anyhow. I wasn't jealous of him. I don't know why. Never did a creature seem to me to be of less importance in life to attract my attention less than this man. But she, how I loved her. How beautiful, graceful, and young she was. She was youth, elegance, freshness itself. Never before had I felt so strongly what a pretty, distinguished, delicate, charming, graceful being woman is. Never before had I appreciated the seductive beauty to be found in the curve of a cheek, the movement of a lip, the pinkness of an ear, the shape of that foolish organ called the nose. This lasted three months, then I left for America, overwhelmed with sadness. But her memory remained in me, persistent, triumphant. From far away, I was as much hers as I had been when she was near me. Years passed by, and I did not forget her. The charming image of her person was ever before my eyes and in my heart, and my love remained true to her, a quiet tenderness now, something like the beloved memory of the most beautiful and the most enchanting thing I had ever met in my life. Twelve years are not much in a lifetime. One does not feel them slip by. The years follow each other gently and quickly, Slowly yet rapidly, each one is long and yet so soon over. They add up so rapidly. They leave so few traces behind them. 
they disappear so completely that when one turns round to look back over bygone years, one sees nothing, and yet one does not understand how one happens to be so old. It seemed to me, really, that hardly a few months separated me from that charming season on the sands of Etretat. Last spring, I went to dine with some friends at Maison Lafitte. Just as the train was leaving, a big, fat lady, escorted by four little girls, got into my car. I hardly looked at this mother hen, very big, very round, with a face as full as the moon, frame in an enormous beribboned hat. She was puffing, out of breath from having been forced to walk quickly. The children began to chatter. I unfolded my paper and began to read. We had just passed Anières when my neighbour suddenly turned to me and said, Excuse me, sir, but uh, are you not Monsieur Garnier? Yes, madame. Then she began to laugh the pleased laugh of a good woman, and yet it was sad. You do not seem to recognize me, I hesitated. It seemed to me that I had seen that face somewhere, but where, when? I answered, yes and no, I certainly know you, and yet I cannot recall your name. She blushed a little. Madame Julie Lefebvre, Never had I received such a shock. In a second, it seemed to me as though it were all over with me. I felt that a veil had been torn from my eyes and that I was going to make a horrible and heart-rending discovery. So that was she, that big, fat, common woman. She! She had become the mother of these four girls since I had last seen her. And these little beings surprised me as much as their mother. They were part of her. They were big girls and already had a place in life. Whereas she no longer counted. She, that marvel of dainty and charming gracefulness. It seemed to me that I had seen her but yesterday. And this is how I found her again. Was it possible? A poignant grief seized my heart, and also a revolt against nature herself, an unreasoning indignation against this brutal, inferious act of destruction. I looked at her, bewildered. Then I took her hand in mine, and tears came to my eyes. I wept for her lost youth for I did not know this fat lady. She was also excited and stammered. I'm greatly changed, am I not? What can you expect? Everything has its time. You see, I've become a mother, nothing but a good mother. Farewell to the rest. That is over. Oh, I never expected you to recognize me if we met. You too have changed. It took me quite a while to be sure that I was not mistaken. Your hair is all right. <laughs> Just think, twelve years ago, twelve years. My oldest girl is already ten. I looked at the child, and I recognized in her something of her mother's old charm, but something as yet unformed, something which promised for the future and life seemed to me as swift as a passing train. We had reached Maison Lafitte. I kissed my old friend's hand. I had found nothing to utter but the most commonplace remarks. I was too much upset to talk. At night, alone at home, I stood in front of the mirror for a long time, a very long time, and I finally remembered what I had been, Finally, so in my mind's eye, my brown moustache, my black hair, and the youthful expression of my face. Now I was old. Farewell. End of Farewell by Guy de Maupassant Read by Neslihan Stamboli
the greatest cheat of seven by a campbell this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by chad horner from ballyclare in county antrim northern ireland situated in the northeast of the island of ireland the greatest cheat of seven a great cheat married the cheating sister of seven cheats one day his father-in-law and seven brothers-in-law came on a visit to his the fish we are now eating is the one i in your presence ordered to proceed from the river to my house this forenoon they were greatly astonished at the wonderful properties possessed by the fishing-rod and expressed a desire to purchase it and offered to pay five rupees for it he escaped their offer and they carried the wonderful fishing-rod home with them next day they arranged to go a-fishing they cast the line into a pool as they had seen the cheat do and said now fish if you do not repair at once to our home we shall not be able to speak well of you having bathed they returned home and asked to see the fish their wives said what fish you give us no fish we have seen no fish where do you throw it down they now knew that their sister's husband was a cheat so they decided to go and charge him with having deceived them the cheat had noticed of their coming and quickly taking his dog with them went to hunt he caught a hare and bringing it home gave it to his wife and said when we reach the end of the street on our way home from hunting you make the dog stand near the house with the dead hare in his mouth he invited his visitors to accompany him for an hour's hunting saying come let us go and kill a hare for dinner so they went to the jungle and presently started a hare the cheat threw a stone at his dog and frightened it so that it ran home he called after it if you do not catch and take that hare home it will not be well for you he then said to his friends come let us return we will find the dog there with the hare before us they replied we doubt it much there is no mistake about it he said we are certain to find both dog and hare on reaching home they find the dog standing waiting for them with a hare in his mouth his brothers-in-law were astonished beyond measure at the sagacity of the dog and they said sell this dog to us we will pay a good price for it he demanded ten rupees which they gladly paid so they returned home and said nothing to him about his having cheated them in the matter of the fishing rod one day taking the dog with them they went to hunt it caught five hares and its masters were greatly delighted with its performance after this the cheat's house was accidentally burnt and he gathering the ashes together set out for the bazaar there to sell them on the way he fell in with a party of merchants who had a large bag full of silver with them they inquired what his bag contained to which he replied gold they agreed to pass the night in the same encampment so having partaken of their evening meal they laid down to sleep at midnight the merchants rose and exchanged the bags and then lay down again the cheat saw them and chuckled within himself in the morning the merchants made haste to leave as they feared the cheat might find out the thief of his bag the cheat asked them before they left to help him to lift his bag on to his bullock's back saying it was to receive assistance from you that i encamped here last night so having helped him to load his bullock they hurried away lest they should be caught the cheat carried his treasure home but being unable to count so much money borrowed a measure from his father-in-law and found that he had four mons of silver on returning the treasure he sent along with it five seers of silver saying for the ashes of my house i received four mons of silver if you reduce your houses to ashes and sell them you will obtain very much more so they foolishly burnt their houses and collecting the ashes went to the bazaar to dispose of them the merchants to whom they offered them directed them to go to the washermen saying they will possibly buy but they also refused and they were compelled to return home without having effected a sale they vowed vengeance on the cheat and set out to find him when they reached his house the cheat was on the point of starting on a journey after mutual salutations he said i have just killed my second wife i go to receive eight mons of silver for her corpse dead bodies bring high prices they said to him how about the ashes we could not sell them he replied 
you did not go far enough from home had you gone to a distance you would have made a good bargain the cheat's youngest wife having died he washed the body and anointed it with oil he then put it in a large bag and loaded it on the back of a bullock and set out on the way he came to a field of wheat into which he drove the animal and then hid himself near by the owner of the field finding the bullock eating his wheat beat it unmercifully with a cudgel the cheat then came from his hiding place and said have you not done wrong in beating my bullock if you have killed my wife where will you flee to i fell behind and for that reason my ox got into your field my wife whom i have newly married is weak and unable to go on foot so i put her into a bag to carry her home on my bullock having opened the bag the wife was found dead and her assailant stood self-convicted of her murder he gave her husband six mons of rupees as hush money so the cheat burnt the corpse and returned home laden with spoil the cheat next sent for his brothers-in-law and showing them the money said kill my second wife and got all this money by selling the corpse they inquired who are the people who buy dead bodies he replied they reside in the rakas country then the seven brothers killed each his youngest wife and carried the bodies to a distant country to dispose of them when the people of that country knew the object for which they had come they said to them what sort of men are you hawking corpses about the towns and villages you must be the worst or else most stupid of men hearing this the brothers were dismayed and began to take in the situation they perceived that the cheat had again deceived them and they retraced their steps homewards bitterly lamenting their folly on reaching their village they cremated the remains of their wives and from that day had no more dealings with the cheat end of the greatest cheat of seven by a campbell the house of judgment by oscar wilde this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rob Marland The House of Judgment And there was silence in the house of judgment, and the man came naked before God. And God opened the book of the life of the man. And God said to the man, Thy life hath been evil, and thou hast shown cruelty to those who were in need of succour, and to those who lacked help thou hast been bitter and hard of heart the poor called to thee and thou didst not hearken and thine ears were closed to the cry of the afflicted the inheritance of the fatherless thou didst take unto thyself and thou didst send the foxes into the vineyard of thy neighbour's field thou didst take the bread of the children and give it to the dogs to eat and the lepers who lived in the marshes and were at peace and praised me thou didst drive forth onto the highways and on mine earth out of which i made thee thou didst spill innocent blood and the man made answer and said even so did i and again god opened the book of the life of the man and god said to the man thy life hath been evil and thou didst seek for the seven sins the walls of thy chamber were painted with images and from the bed of thine abominations thou didst rise up to the sound of flutes thou didst build seven altars to the sins i have suffered and didst eat of the thing that may not be eaten and the purple of thy raiment was broidered with the three signs of shame thine idols were neither of gold nor of silver which endure but of flesh that dieth thou didst stain their hair with colours and set pomegranates in their hands thou didst stain their feet with perfumes and spread carpets before them with antimony thou didst stain their eyelids and their bodies thou didst smear with myrrh thou didst bow thyself to the ground before them and the thrones of the idols were set in the sun thou didst show to the sun thy shame and to the moon thy madness and the man made answer and said 
even so did I. And a third time God opened the book of the life of the man. And God said to the man, Evil hath been thy life, and with evil didst thou requite good, and with wrong doing kindness. The hands that fed thee thou didst wound, and the breasts that gave thee suck thou didst despise. He who came to thee with water went away thirsting, and the outlawed men who hid thee in their tents at night thou didst betray before dawn. Thine enemy who spared thee thou didst snare in an ambush, and the friend who walked with thee thou didst sell for a price, and to those who brought thee love thou didst ever give lust in thy turn. And the man made answer, and said, Even so did I. And God closed the book of the life of the man, and said, Surely I shall send thee to hell, even unto hell shall I send thee. And the man cried out, Thou canst not. And God said to the man, Wherefore can I not send thee to hell, and for what reason? And the man made answer, and said, Because in hell have I always lived. And there was silence in the house of judgment. And after a space God spake, and said to the man, Seeing that I may not send thee to hell, surely I shall send thee to heaven, even unto heaven shall I send thee. And the man cried out, Thou canst not. And God said to the man, Wherefore can I not send thee to heaven, and for what reason? And the man made answer, and said, Because never, and in no place, have I been able to imagine heaven. And there was silence in the house of judgment. End of the House of Judgment by Oscar Wilde Homecoming by Miguel Hidalgo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Homecoming by Miguel Hidalgo. What lasts forever? Does love? Does death? Nothing lasts forever. Not even forever. The large horse plodded slowly over the shifting sand. The rider was of medium size, with huge, strong hands and seemingly hollow eyes, strange eyes, alive and aflame. They had no place in the dust-caked, tired body, yet here they were, seeking, always seeking, searching the clear horizon and never seeming to find what they sought. The horse moved faster now. They were nearing a river. The water would be welcome on tired bodies and dry throats. He spurred his horse, and when they reached the water's edge, he dismounted and unsaddled the horse. Then both man and horse plunged headlong into the waiting torrent, deep into the cool embrace of the clear liquid. They soaked it into their pores and drank deeply of it, feeling life going once more through their veins. Satisfied, they lifted themselves from the water, and the man lay down on the yellow sand of the river bank to sleep. When he awoke, the sun was almost setting. The bright shaft of red light spilled across the sky, making the mountains silent scarlet shadows on the face of the rippling water. Quickly he gathered driftwood and built a small fire. From his pack he removed some of the coffee he had found in one of the ruined cities. He brought water from the river in the battered coffee pot he had salvaged, and while he waited for it to boil, he went to his horse, conqueror, stroking his mane and whispering in his ear. Then he led him silently to a grassy slope where he hobbled him and left him for the night. In the fading light, he ate the hard beef jerky and drank the scalding coffee. Refreshed and momentarily content, he sat staring into the dying fire, seeing the bright glowing coals as living fingers clutching at the wood in a consuming embrace, taking all and returning nothing but ashes. Slowly his eyelids yielded, his body sagged, and blood seemed to fill his brain, bathing it in a gentle warm flood. He slept, his brain slept, but the portion of his brain called memory stirred. It was all alone, all else was at rest. 
Images began to appear, drawn from inexhaustible files, wherein are kept all thoughts, past, present and future. It was the night before he was to go overseas. World War III had been declared and he had enlisted, receiving his old rank of captain. He was with his wife in the living room of their home. They had put the children to bed, their sons, and now sat on the couch watching the blazing fire. It was then that he had showed it to her. I've got something to tell you and something to show you. He had removed the box from his pocket and opened it and heard her cry of surprised joy. Oh, a ring! It's a diamond too! She cried in her rich, happy voice, which always seemed to send a thrill through his body. It's for you. So long as you wear it, I'll come back, even from the dead, if need be. Read the inscription. She held the ring up to the light and read aloud. It is forever. Then she slipped the ring onto her finger and her arms around him. He held her very close, feeling the warmth from her body flowing into his and making him oblivious to everything except that she was there in his arms and that he was sinking deep, deep into a familiar sea where he had been many times before but each time found something new and unexplored, some vastly different emotion he could never quite explain. Wait, she cried, I've got something for you too. She took off the locket she wore about her neck and held it up to the shimmering light, letting it spin at the end of its chain. It caught the shadows of the fire and reflected them, greatly magnified over the room. It was in the shape of a star, encrusted with emeralds, with one large ruby in the centre. When he opened it, he found a picture of her on one side and in the other a picture of the children. He took her in his arms again and loosened her long black hair burying his face in it for a moment. Then he kissed her and instantly was drawn down into the abyss which seemed to have no beginning or any end. The next morning had been bleak and grey. The mist clung to the wet sodden ground and the air was heavy in his lungs. He had driven off in the jeep the army had sent for him, watching her there on the porch until the mist swirled around her feet and she ran back into the house and slammed the door. His cold fingers found the locket, making a little bulge under his uniform, and the touch of it seemed to warm the blood in his veins. Three days later, they landed in Spain, merged with another division, then crossed the Pyrenees into France, and finally to Paris, where the fighting had begun. Already, the city was a silent graveyard, littered with the rubble of towers and cathedrals which had once been great. Three years later, they were on the road to Moscow. Over a thousand miles lay behind, a dead man on every foot of those miles, yet victory was near. The Russians had not yet used the H-bomb. The threat of annihilation by the retaliation forces had been too great. He had done well in the war and had been decorated many times for bravery in action. Now he felt the victory that seemed to be in the air, and he had wished it could come quickly so that he might return to her. Home. The very feel of the word was everything a battle-weary soldier needed to make him fight harder and live longer. Suddenly, he had become aware of a droning, whooshing sound above him. It grew louder and louder until he knew what it was. Heavy bombers! The alarm had sounded, and the men had headed for their foxholes. But the planes had passed over, the sun glinting on their bellies, reflecting a blinding light. They were bound for bigger, more important targets. When the all-clear had sounded, the men clambered from their shelters. An icy wind swept over the field, bringing with it clouds that covered the sun. A strange fear had gripped him then. Across the Atlantic, over the Pole, via Alaska, the great bombers flew. In the cities, great and small, the air raid sirens sounded, high screaming noises which had jarred the people from sleep in time to die. The defending planes roared into the sky to intercept the onrushing bombers. The horrendous battle split the universe. Many bombers fell, victims of fanatical suicide planes or missiles that streaked across the sky which none could escape. But too many bombers got through, dropping their deadly cargo upon the helpless cities, and not all the prayers or entreaties to any god had stopped their carnage. First there had been the red flashes that melted buildings into molten streams and then the great triple mushroom cloud filled with the poisonous gases that the wind swept away to other cities where men had not died quickly and mercifully but had rotted away leaving the shreds of putrid flesh behind to mark the places where they had crawled. 
The retaliatory forces had roared away to bomb the Russian cities. Few, if any, had returned. Too much blood and life were on their hands. Those who had remained alive had found a resting place on the crown of some distant mountain. Others had preferred the silent, peaceful sea, where flesh stayed not long on bones, and only the darting fishes and merciful beams of filtered light found their aluminium coffins. The war had ended. To no avail. Neither side had won. Most of the cities and the majority of the population of both countries had been destroyed. Even their governments had vanished, leaving a silent nothingness. The armies that remained were without leaders, without sources of supplies, save for what they could forage and beg from an unfriendly people. They were alone now, a group of tired, battered men for whom life held nothing. Their families had long since died, their bodies turned to dust, their spirits fled on the winds to a new world. Yet these remnants of an army must return, or at least try. Their exodus was just beginning. Somehow he had managed to hold together the few men left from his force. He had always nourished the hope that she might still be alive, and now that the war was over he had to return. He had to know whether she was still waiting for him. They had started the long trek. Throughout Europe anarchy reigned. He and his men were alone. All they could do now was fight. Finally they reached the seaport city of Calais. With what few men he had left he had commandeered a small yacht and they had taken to the sea. After months of storms and bad luck, they had been shipwrecked somewhere off the coast of Mexico. He had managed to swim ashore and had been found by a fisherman's family. Many months he had spent swimming and fishing, recovering his strength, inquiring about the United States. The Mexicans had spoken with fear of the land across the Rio Grande. All its great cities had been destroyed and those that had only been partially destroyed were devoid of people. The land across the Rio Grande had become a land of shadows. The winds were poisoned and the few people who might have survived were crazed and maimed by the blasts. Few men had dared cross the Rio Grande into El Mundo de Gris, Noviembre, the November world. Those who had had never returned. In time he had travelled north until he reached the Rio Grande. Then he had waded into the muddy waters and somehow landed on the American side in the November world. It was rightly called. The deserts were long. All the plant life had died, leaving to those once great fertile stretches nothing but the sad temporal beauty that comes with death. No people had he seen, only the ruins of what had once been their cities. He had walked through them, and all that he had seen were the small mutant rodents, and all that he had heard was the occasional swish of the wind as it whisked along what might have been dead leaves but wasn't. He had been on the trail for a long time. His food was nearly exhausted. The mountains were just beginning and he hoped to find food there. He had not found food, but his luck had been with him. He had found a horse, not a normal horse, but a mutation. It was almost twice as large as a regular horse. Its skin seemed to shimmer and was like glassy steel to the touch. From the centre of its forehead grew a horn, straight out as the horn of a unicorn. But most startling of all were the animal's eyes which seemed to speak, a silent mental speech which he could understand. The horse had looked up as he approached it and seemed to say, follow me. And he had followed, over a mountain, until they came to a pass and finally to a narrow path which led to an old cabin. He had found it empty, but there were cans of food and a rifle and many shells. He had remained there a long time. How long, he could not tell, for he could only measure time by the cycles of the sun and the moon. Finally, he had taken the horse, the rifle and what food was left and once again started the long journey home. The farther north he went, the more life seemed to have survived. He had seen great herds of horses like his own stampeding across the plains and strange birds which he could not identify, yet he had seen no human beings. But he knew he was closer now, closer to home. He recognised the land. How, he did not know, for it was much changed, a sensing, perhaps, of what it had once been. He could not be more than two days' ride away. Once he was through the desert, he would find her. He would be with her once again. All would be well, and his long journey would be over. The images faded. Even memory slept in a flow of warm blood. The body and mind slept into the shadows of the dawn. He awoke and stretched the cramped muscles of his body, 
At the edge of the water, he removed his clothes and stared at himself in the rippling mirror. His muscles were lean and hard, evenly placed throughout the length of his frame. A deep ridge ran down the length of his torso, separating the muscles, making the chest broad. Well satisfied with his body, he plunged into the cold water, deep down, until he thought his lungs would burst, then swiftly returned to the clean air, tingling in every pore. He dried himself and dressed. Conqueror was eating the long grass near the stream. Quickly he saddled him. No time for breakfast. He would ride all day and the next night, and he would be home. Still northward, the hours crawled slower than a dying man. The sun was a torch that pierced his skin, seeming to melt his bones into a burning stream within his body. But the day at last gave way to night and the sun to the moon. The torch became a white pockmarked goddess with streaming hair called stars. In the moonlight, he had not seen the crater until he was at its very edge. Even then, he might not have seen it had not the horse stopped suddenly. The wind swirled through its vast emptiness, slapping his face with dusty hands. For a moment, he thought he heard voices, mournful, murmuring voices, echoing up from the misty depths. He turned quickly away and did not look back. Night paled into day, day burned into night. There were clouds in the sky now, and a gentle wind caressed the sweat from his tired body. He stopped. There it was! There it was! Barely discernible through the moonlight. He saw it. Home. Quickly, he dismounted and ran. He could now see a small light in the window, and he knew they were there. His breath came in hard, ragged gulps. At the window, he peered in, and as his eyes became accustomed to the inner gloom, he saw how bare the room was. No matter. Now that he was home, he would build new furniture, and the house would be even better than it had been before. Then he saw her. She was sitting motionless in a straight wooden chair beside the fireplace, the feeble light cast by the embers veiling her in mauve shadows. He waited, wondering if she were... Presently, she stirred like a restless child in sleep, then moved from the chair to the pile of wood near the hearth and replenished the fire. The wood caught quickly, sending up long tongues of flame and forming a bright pool of light around her. His blood froze. The creature illuminated by the firelight was a monster. Large, greasy scales covered its face and arms, and there was no hair on its head. Its gums were toothless cavities in a sunken, mumbling mouth. The eyes turned momentarily towards the window, were empty of life. No, no, he cried soundlessly. This was not his house. In his delirium, he had only imagined he had found it. He had been searching so long. He would go on searching. He turned wearily away from the window when the movement of the creature beside the fire held his attention. It had taken a ring from one skeleton-like finger and stood turning the ring slowly as if trying to decipher some inscription inside it. Then he knew he had come home. Slowly he moved towards the door. A great weakness was upon him. His feet were stones, reluctant to leave the earth. His body was a weed, shriveled by thirst. He grasped the doorknob and clung to it, looking up at the night sky and trying to draw strength from the wind that passed over him. It was no use. There was no strength, only fear, a kind of fear he had never known. He fumbled at his throat, his fingers crawling like cold worms around his neck until he found the locket and the clasp which had held it safely through endless nightmare days and nights. He slipped the clasp and the locket fell into his waiting hand. As one in a dream, he opened it and stared at the pictures, now in the dim moonlight, no longer faces of those he loved, but grey ghosts from the past. Even the ruby had lost its glow. What had once been living fire was now a dull glob of darkness. Nothing is forever, he thought, as he shouted the words, but only a thin sound, the sound of leaves ruffled by the wind, came back to him. He closed the locket and fastened the clasp and hung it on the doorknob. It moved slowly in the wind, back and forth like a pendulum. Forever, forever, only death is forever. He could have sworn he heard the words. He ran away from the house to the large horse with a horn in the centre of its forehead like a unicorn. Once in the saddle, the spurt of strength left him. His shoulders slumped, his head dropped into his chest. Conqueror trotted away, the sound of his hooves echoing hollowly in the vast emptiness. 
End of Homecoming by Miguel Hidalgo. Recording by Andrew Gibson, Sujo, jellypie.co.uk forward slash audiobooks. It Snows by Enrico Castelnuovo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nistihan Stamboli It snows. The thermometer marks barely one degree above freezing. The sky is covered with ominous white clouds. The air is harsh and piercing. What can induce Signor Eduardo at nine o'clock on such a morning to stand in his study window. It is true that Signor Eduardo is a vigorous man in the prime of life, but it is never wise to tempt Providence by needlessly risking one's health. But stay, I begin to think that I have found a clue to his conduct. Opposite Signor Eduardo's window is the window of the Signora Evelina, and Signora Evelina has the same tastes as Signor Eduardo. She too is taking the air, leaning against the window sill in her dressing gown, her fair curls falling upon her forehead and tossed back every now and then by a pretty movement of her head. The street is so narrow that it is easy to talk across from one side to the other, but in such weather as this, the only two windows that stand open are those of Signora Evelina and Signor Eduardo. There is no denying the fact. Signora Evelina who, within the last few weeks, has taken up her abode across the way, is a very fascinating little widow. Her hair is of spun gold, her skin of milk and roses. Her little turned-up nose, though assuredly not Grecian, is much more attractive than if it were. She has the most dazzling teeth and the most kissable mouth. Her eyes are transparent as a cloudless sky, and... Well, she knows how to use them. Nor is this the sum total of her charms. Look at the soft, graceful curves of her agile, well-proportioned figure. Look at her little hands and feet. After all, one hardly wonders that Signor Eduardo runs the risk of catching his death of cold instead of closing the window and warming himself at the stove which roars so cheerfully within. It is rather at Signora Evelina that I wonder, for though Signor Eduardo is not an ill-looking man, he is close upon forty, while she is but twenty-four. So young, and already a widow. Poor Signora Evelina. It is true that she has great strength of character, but six months have elapsed since her husband's death, and she is resigned to it already, though the deceased left her barely enough to keep body and soul together. Happily, Signora Evelina is not encumbered with her family. She is alone and independent, and with those eyes, that hair, that little upturned nose, she ought to have no difficulty in finding a second husband. In fact, there is no harm in admitting that Signora Evelina has contemplated the possibility of a second marriage, and that if the would-be bridegroom is not in his first youth, why, she is prepared to make the best of it. In this connection, it is perhaps not uninstructive to note that Signor Eduardo is in comfortable circumstances and is himself a widower. What a coincidence! Well then, why don't they marry? That being the customary denouement in such cases, why don't they marry? Well, Signor Eduardo is still undecided. If there had been any hope of a love affair, I fear that his indecision would have vanished long ago. Errare umanum est. But Signora Evelina is a woman of serious views. She is in search of a husband, not of a flirtation. Signora Evelina is a person of great determination. She knows how to turn other people's heads without letting her own be moved a jot. Signora Evelina is deep, deep enough, surely, to gain her point. If Signor Eduardo flutters about her much longer, he will singe his wings. Things cannot go on in this way. Signor Eduardo's visits are too frequent. And now, in addition, there are the conversations from the window. 
It is time for a decisive step to be taken, and Signor Eduardo is afraid that he may find himself taking the step before he is prepared to, this very day, perhaps, when he goes to call on the widow. The door of Signor Eduardo's study is directly opposite the window in which he is standing, and the opening of this door is therefore made known to him by a violent draught. As he turns, a sweet voice says, Goodbye, Papa dear. I'm going to school. Goodbye, Doretta, he answers, stooping to kiss a pretty little maid of eight or nine, and at the same instant, Signora Evelina calls out from over the way. Good morning, Doretta. Doretta, who had made a little grimace on discovering her papa in conversation with his pretty neighbor, makes another as she hears herself greeted and mutters reluctantly, Good morning. Then, with her little basket on her arm, she turns away slowly to join the maidservant who is waiting for her in the hall. I'm so fond of that child, sighs Signora Evelina with the sweetest inflection in her voice. But she doesn't like me at all. What an absurd idea. Doretta is a very self-willed child. Thus, Signor Eduardo, but in his heart of hearts, he too is convinced that his little daughter has no fondness for Signora Evelina. Meanwhile, the cold is growing more intense, and every now and then a flake of snow spins around upon the wind. Short of wishing to be frozen stiff, there is nothing for it but to shut the window. It snows, says Signora Evelina, glancing upward. Oh, it was sure to come. Well, I must go and look after my household. Au revoir. Shall I see you later? I hope to have the pleasure. Au revoir, then. Signora Evelina closes the window, nods and smiles once more through the pane and disappears. Signor Eduardo turns back to his study and, perceiving how cold it has grown, throws some wood on the fire and, kneeling before the door of the stove, tries to blow the embers into a blaze. The flames leap up with a merry noise, sending bright flashes along the walls of the room. Outside, the flakes continue to descend at intervals. Perhaps, after all, it is not going to be a snowstorm. Signor Eduardo paces up and down the room with bent head and hands thrust in his pockets. He is disturbed, profoundly disturbed. He feels that he has reached a crisis in his life, that in a few days, perhaps in a few hours, his future will be decided. Is he seriously in love with Signora Evelina? How long has he known her? Will she be sweet and good like the other? Will she know how to be a mother to Doretta? There is a sound of steps in the hall. Signor Eduardo pauses in the middle of the room. The door reopens and Doretta rushes up to her father, her cheeks flushed, her hood falling over her forehead, her warm coat buttoned up to her chin, her hands thrust into her muff. It's snowing and the teacher has sent us home. She tosses off her hood and coat and goes up to the stove. There is a good fire, but the room is cold, she exclaims. As a matter of fact, the window having stood open for half an hour, the thermometer indicates but 50 degrees. Papa, Doretta goes on, I want to stay with you all day long today. And suppose your poor daddy has affairs of his own to attend to. No, 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 you must give them up for today. And Doretta, without waiting for an answer, runs to fetch her books, her doll, and her work. The books are spread out on the desk, the doll is comfortably seated on the sofa, and the work is laid out upon a low stool. Oh, she cries with an air of importance. What a mercy that there is no school today. I shall have time to go over my lesson. Oh, look how it snows. It snows indeed. First, the white powder, fine but thick, and whirled in circles by the wind, beats with a dry metallic sound against the window panes. Then the wind drops, and the flakes, growing larger, descend silently, monotonously, incessantly. The snow covers the streets like a downy carpet. 
spreads itself like a sheet over the roofs, fills up the cracks in the walls, heaps itself upon the window sills, envelopes the iron window bars, and hangs in festoons from the gutters and eaves. Out of doors it must be as cold as ever, but the room is growing rapidly warmer, and Doretta, climbing on a chair, has the satisfaction of announcing that the mercury has risen eleven degrees. Yes, dear, her father replies, and the clock is striking eleven too. Run and tell them to get breakfast ready. Doretta runs off obediently, but reappears in a moment. Daddy, Daddy, what do you suppose has happened? The dining room stove won't draw, and the room is all full of smoke. Then let us breakfast here, child. This excellent suggestion is joy to the soul of Doretta, who hastens to carry the news to the kitchen, and then in a series of journeys back and forth from the dining room to the study, transports with her own hands the knives, forks, plates, tablecloth, and napkins, and, with the manservant's aid, lays them out upon one of her papa's tables. How merry she is! How completely the cloud has vanished that darkened her brow a few hours earlier! And how well she acquits herself of her household duties! Signor Eduardo, watching her with a sense of satisfaction, cannot resist exclaiming, Bravo, Doretta! Doretta is undeniably the very image of her mother. She too was just such an excellent housekeeper a model of order, of neatness, of propriety. And she was pretty, like Doretta, even though she did not possess the fair hair and captivating eyes of Signora Evelina. The manservant who brings in the breakfast is accompanied by a newcomer, the cat Melanio, who is always present at Doretta's meals. The cat Melanio is old. He has known Doretta ever since she was born and he honors her with his protection. Every morning he mews at her door as though to inquire if she has slept well. Every evening he keeps her company until it is time for her to go to bed. Whenever she goes out, he speeds her with a gentle purr. Whenever he hears her come in, he hurries to meet her and rubs himself against her legs. In the morning and at the midday meal, when she takes it at home, he sits beside her chair and silently waits for the scraps from her plate. The cat Melanio, however, is not in the habit of visiting Signor Eduardo's study and shows a certain surprise at finding himself there. Signor Eduardo, for his part, receives his new guest with some diffidence, but Doretta, intervening in Melanio's favor, undertakes to answer for his good conduct. It is long since Doretta has eaten with so much appetite. When she has finished her breakfast, she clears the table as deftly and promptly as she had laid it, and in a few moments, Signor Eduardo's study has resumed its wonted appearance. Only the cat Melanio remains, comfortably established by the stove, on the understanding that he is to be left there as long as he is not troublesome. The continual coming and going has made the room grow colder. The mercury has dropped perceptibly, and Doretta, to make it rise again, empties nearly the whole wood basket into the stove. How it snows! How it snows! No longer in detached flakes, but as though an open-work white cloth were continuously unrolled before one's eyes. Signor Eduardo begins to think that it will be impossible for him to call on Signora Evelina. True, it is only a step, but he would sink into the snow up to his knees. After all, it's only twelve o'clock. It may stop snowing later. Doretta is struck by a luminous thought. What if I were to answer Grandmama's letter? In another moment, Doretta is seated at her father's desk in his armchair, two cushions raising her to the requisite height, her legs dangling into space, the pen suspended in her hand, and her eyes fixed upon a sheet of ruled paper containing thus far but two words. Dear Grandmama, Signor Eduardo, leaning against the stove, watches his daughter with a smile. It appears that at last Doretta has discovered a way of beginning her letter 
for she replunges the pen into the inkstand, lowers her hand to the sheet of paper, wrinkles her forehead, and sticks out her tongue. After several minutes of assiduous toil, she raises her head and asks, What shall I say to Grandmama about her invitation to go and spend a few weeks with her? Tell her that you can't go now, but that she may expect you in the spring. With you, Papa? With me, yes, Signor Eduardo answers mechanically. Yet, if in the meantime he engages himself with Signora Evelina, this visit to his mother-in-law will become rather an awkward business. There, I finished, Doretta cries with an air of triumph. But the cry is succeeded by another, half of anguish, half of rage. What's the matter now? A blot. Let me see. You little goose, what have you done? You've ruined the letter now. Doretta, having endeavoured to remove the ink spot by licking it, has torn the paper. Oh dear, I shall have to copy it out now, she says in a mortified tone. You can copy it this evening. Bring it here and let me look at it. Uh, not bad, not bad at all. A few letters to be added and a few to be taken out, but on the whole, for a chit of your size, it's fairly creditable. Good girl. Doretta rests upon her laurels, playing with her doll Nini. She dresses Nini in her best gown and takes her to call on the cat Melanio. The cat Melanio, who is dozing with half-open eyes, is somewhat bored by these attentions. Raising himself on his four poles, he arches his flexible body and then rolls himself up into a ball, turning his back upon his visitor. Dear me, Melania is not very polite today, says Doretta, escorting the doll back to the sofa. But you mustn't be offended. He is very seldom impolite. I think it must be the weather. Doesn't the weather make you sleepy too, Nini? Come, let's take a nap. Goodbye, bye, baby. Goodbye, bye. Nini sleeps. Her head rests upon a cushion. Her little rag and horsehair body is wrapped in a woolen coverlet. Her lids are closed, for Nini raises or lowers her lids according to the position of her body. Signor Eduardo looks at the clock and then glances out of the window. It's two o'clock and the snow is still falling. Doretta is struck by another idea. Teddy, see if I know my La Fontaine fable. Le Corboy et le Renard. Very well, let's hear it. Signor Eduardo assents, taking the open book from the little girl's hands. Loretta begins. Maître Corbeau, sur un arbre perche, tenait en son bec un fromage. Maître, uh, uh, maître, maître, go on. Maître, maître renard. Oh yes, now I remember. Maître renard, par l'odeur lèche. Lui tint à peu près ce langage. Hey, bonjour. At this point, Doretta, seeing that her father is not listening to her, breaks off her recitation. Signor Eduardo has, in fact, closed the book upon his forefinger and is looking elsewhere. Well, Doretta, he absently inquires. Why don't you go on? I'm not going to say any more of it, she answers sullenly. Why are you cross patch? What's the matter? The little girl, who had been seated on a low stool, has risen to her feet and now sees why her papa has not been attending to her. The snow is falling less thickly and the fair head of Signora Evelina has appeared behind the window panes over the way. Brave little woman. She has actually opened the window and is clearing the snow off the sill with a fire shovel. Her eyes meet Signor Eduardo's. She smiles and shakes her head as though to say, what hateful weather! He would be an ill-mannered boor who should not feel impelled to say a word to the Dante Signora Evelina. Signor Eduardo, who is not an ill-mannered boor, yields to the temptation of opening the window for a moment. Bravo, Signora Evelina, I see you're not afraid of the snow. Ah, oh, Signor Eduardo, what fiendish weather! But if I'm not mistaken, that is Doretta with you. How do you do, Doretta? Doretta, come here and say how do you do to the lady. No, 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 let her be, let her be. 
children catch cold so easily, you'd better shut the window. I suppose there's no hope of seeing you today. Look at the condition of the streets. Oh, you man, you man, the stronger sex. But no matter. Au revoir. Au revoir. The two windows are closed simultaneously, but this time Signora Evelina does not disappear. She is sitting there close to the window, and it snows so lightly now that her wonderful profile is outlined as clearly as possible against the pane. Good heavens, how beautiful she is! Signor Eduardo walks up and down the room in the worst of humours. He feels that it is wrong not to go and see the fascinating widow, and that to go and see her would be still more wrong. The cloud has settled again upon Doretta's forehead the same cloud that darkened it in the morning. Not a word is said of La Fontaine's fable. Instead, Signor Eduardo grumbles irritably. This blessed room is as cold as ever. Why shouldn't it be? Doretta retorts with a touch of asperity. When you open the window every few minutes. Aha, uh -huh, Signor Eduardo says to himself. It's time to have this matter out. And going up to Doretta, he takes her by the hand, leads her to the sofa, and lifts her on his knee. Now then, Doretta, why is it that you're so disagreeable to Signora Evelina? The little girl, not knowing what to answer, grows red and embarrassed. What has Signora Evelina done to you? Her father continues. She hasn't done anything to me. And yet you don't like her. Profound silence. And she likes you so much. I don't care if she does. You naughty child. And what if one of these days you had to live with Signora Evelina? I won't live with her. I won't live with her. The child bursts out. Now you're talking foolishly. Signor Eduardo admonishes her in a severe tone, setting her down from his knee. She bursts into passionate weeping. Come, Doretta, come. Is this the way you keep your daddy company? Enough of this, Doretta. But say what he pleases, Doretta must have her cry. Her brown eyes are swimming in tears. Her little breast heaves. Her voice is broken by sobs. What ridiculous whims, Signor Eduardo exclaims, throwing his head back against the sofa cushions. Signor Eduardo is unjust, and, what is worse, he does not believe what he's saying. He knows that this is no whim of Doretta's. He knows it better than the child herself, who would probably find it difficult to explain what she is undergoing. It is at once the presentiment of a new danger and the renewal of a bygone sorrow. Doretta was barely six years old when her mother died, and yet her remembrance is indelibly impressed upon the child's mind. And now it seems as though her mother were dying again. When you have finished crying, Doretta, you may come here, Signor Eduardo says. Doretta, crouching in a corner of the room, cries less vehemently, but has not yet finished crying. Just like the weather outside, it snows less heavily, but it still snows. Signor Eduardo covers his eyes with his hand. How many thoughts are thronging through his head? How many affections are contending in his heart? If he could but banish the vision of Signora Evelina, but he tries in vain. He is haunted by those blue eyes, by that persuasive smile, that graceful and harmonious presence. He has but to say the word, and he knows that she will be his, to brighten his solitary home and fill it with life and love. Her presence would take ten years from his age. He would feel as he did when he was betrothed for the first time. And yet, no, it would not be quite like the first time. He is not the same man that he was then. And she, the other, ah, oh, how different she was from the Signora Evelina. How modest and shy she was. How girlishly reserved, even in the expression of her love. How beautiful were her sudden blushes. How sweet the droop of her long, shyly lowered lashes. He had known her first in the intimacy of her own home, simple, shy, a good daughter and a good sister, as she was destined to be a good wife and mother. 
For a while he had loved her in silence, and she had returned his love. One day, walking beside her in the garden, he had seized her hand with sudden impetuosity, and raising it to his lips, had said, I care for you so much. And she, pale and trembling, had run to her mother's arms, crying out, Oh, how happy I am! Ah, those dear days, those dear days! He was a poet then, with the accent of sincerest passion he whispered in his love's ear. I love thee more than all the world beside, my only faith and hope thou art, my God, my country and my bride, sole love of this unchanging heart. Very bad poetry, but deliciously thrilling to his young betrothed. Oh, the dear, dear days! Oh, the long hours that passed like a flash in delightful talk, the secrets that the soul first reveals to itself in revealing them to the beloved, the caresses longed for and yet half feared, the lovers' quarrels, the tears that are kissed away, the shynesses, the simplicity, the abandonment of a pure and passionate love. Who may hope to know you twice in a lifetime? No, Signora Evelina can never restore what he has lost to Signor Eduardo. No, this self-possessed widow, who, after six months of mourning, has already started on the hunt for a second husband, cannot inspire him with the fate that he felt in the other. Ah, oh, first-loved women, why is it that you must die? For the dead give no kisses, no caresses and the living long to be caressed and kissed. Who talks of kisses? Here is one that has a lit, all soft and warm, on Signor Eduardo's lips, rousing him with a start. Ah, is it you, Doretta? It is Doretta, who says nothing, but who is longing to make it up with her daddy. She lays her cheek against his, he presses her little head close, lest she should escape from him. He too is silent. What can he say to her? It is growing dark, and the eyes of the cat Melanio begin to glitter in the corner by the stove. The man servant knocks and asks if he is to bring the lamp. Make up the fire first, Signor Eduardo says. The wood crackles and snaps and sends up showers of sparks. Then it bursts into flame, blazing away with a regular, monotonous sound, like the breath of a sleeping giant. In the dusk, the firelight flashes upon the walls, brings out the pattern of the wallpaper, and travels far enough to illuminate a corner of the desk. The shadows lengthen and then shorten again, thicken and then shrink. Everything in the room seems to be continually changing its size and shape. Signor Eduardo, giving free rein to his thoughts, evokes the vision of his married life, sees the baby's cradle, recalls her first cries and smiles, feels again his dying wife's last kiss, and hears the last word upon her lips. Doretta. No, no, it's impossible that he should ever do anything to make his Doretta unhappy. And yet, he is not sure of resisting Signora Evelina's wiles. He is almost afraid that when he sees his enchantress on the morrow, all his strong resolves may take flight. There is but one way out of it. Doretta, says Signor Eduardo. Tada, are you going to copy out your letter to your grandmamma this evening? Yes, father. Wouldn't you rather go and see your grandmamma yourself? With whom? The child falters anxiously her little heart beating a frantic tattoo as she awaits his answer. With me, Doretta. With you, Daddy? she exclaims, hardly daring to believe her ears. Yes, with me, with your Daddy. Oh, Daddy, Daddy! she cries, her little arms about his neck, her kisses covering his face. Daddy, my own dear Daddy, when shall we start? Tomorrow morning. If you're not afraid of the snow. Why not now? Why not at once? Gently, gently, good Lord, doesn't the child want her dinner first? And Signor Eduardo, gently detaching himself from his daughter's embrace, 
rises and rings for the lamp. Then, instinctively, he glances once more towards the window. In the opposite house, all is dark, and Signora Evelina's profile is no longer outlined against the pane. The weather is still threatening, and now and then a snowflake falls. The servant closes the shutters and draws the curtains so that no profane gaze may penetrate into the domestic sanctuary. We had better dine in here, Signor Eduardo says. The dining room must be as cold as Greenland. Doretta, meanwhile, is convulsing the kitchen with the noisy announcement of the impending journey. At first, she is thought to be joking, but when she establishes the fact that she is speaking seriously, it is respectfully pointed out to her that the master of the house must be crazy to start on a journey in the depth of winter and in such weather, if at least they were to wait for a fine day. But what does Doretta care for the comments of the kitchen? She is beside herself with joy. She sings, she dances about the room and breaks off every moment or two to give her father a kiss. Then she pours out the fullness of her emotion upon the cat Melanio and the doll Nini promising the latter to bring her back a new frock from Milan. At dinner, she eats little and talks incessantly of the journey, asking again and again what time it is and at what time they are to start. Are you afraid of missing the train? Signor Eduardo asks with a smile. And yet, though he dissembles his impatience, it is as great as hers. He longs to go away, far away. Perhaps he may not return until spring. He orders his luggage packed for an absence of two months. Loretta goes to bed early, but all night long she tosses about under the bedclothes, waking her nurse twenty times to ask, Is it time to get up? Signor Eduardo, too, is awake when the manservant comes to call him the next morning at six o'clock. What sort of a day is it? Very bad, sir. Just such another as yesterday. In fact, if I might make the suggestion, sir... If it's not necessary for you to start today, it is, Angelo, absolutely necessary. At the station, there are only a few sleepy, depressed-looking travellers wrapped in furs. They're all grumbling about the weather, about the cold, about the earliness of the hour, and declaring that nothing but the most urgent business would have got them out of bed at that time of day. There is but one person in the station who is all liveliness and smiles. Doretta. The first-class compartment in which Signor Eduardo and his daughter find themselves is bitterly cold in spite of foot warmers, but Doretta finds the temperature delicious, and, if she dared, would open the windows for the pleasure of looking out. Are you happy, Doretta? Oh, so happy! Ten years earlier, on a pleasanter day, but also in winter, Signor Eduardo had started on his wedding journey. Opposite him had sat a young girl, who looked as much like Doretta as a woman can look like a child, a pretty, sedate young girl. Oh, so sweetly, tenderly, in love with Signor Eduardo. And as the train started, he had asked her the same question. Are you happy, Maria? And she had answered, Oh, so happy, just like Doretta. The train races and flies. Farewell. Farewell forever, Signora Evelina. And did Signora Evelina die of despair? Oh, no. Signora Evelina has a perfect disposition and a delightful home. The perfect disposition enables her not to take things too seriously. The delightful home affords her a thousand distractions. Its windows do not all look towards Signor Eduardo's residence. One of them, for example commands a little garden belonging to a worthy bachelor who smokes his pipe there on pleasant days. Signora Evelina finds the worthy bachelor to her taste, and the worthy bachelor, who is an average adjuster by profession, admires Signora Evelina's eyes and considers her handsomely and solidly enough put together to rank A number one on Lloyd's registers. The result is that the bachelor now and then looks up at the window and the Signora Evelina now and then looks down at the garden. The weather, not being propitious to out-of-door conversation, Signora Evelina at length invites her neighbor to come and pay her a visit. Her neighbor hesitates, and she renews the invitation. 
How can one resist such a charming woman? And what does one visit signify? Nothing at all. The excellent average adjuster has every reason to be pleased with his reception, the more so as Signora Evelina actually gives him leave to bring his pipe the next time he comes. She adores the smell of a pipe. Signora Evelina is an ideal woman, just the wife for a businessman who had not positively made up his mind to remain single. And as to that, muses the average adjuster, have I ever positively made up my mind to remain single? And if I have, who is to prevent my changing it? And so it comes to pass that when, after an absence of three months, Signor Eduardo returns home with Doretta, he receives notice of the approaching marriage of Signora Evelina Chiocci, widow Ramboldi, with Signor Archimede Fagiolo. Fagiolo? shouts Doretta. <laughs> Fagiolo? The name seems to excite her unbounded hilarity, but I'm under the impression that the real cause of her merriment is not so much Signora Evelina's husband as Signora Evelina's marriage. End of It Snows by Enrico Castelnuovo Recording by Neslihan Stambuli Little China Doll by Abby Phillips Walker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner from Liverpool. Little China Doll. In a shop window sat a little China Doll. She had been in the store so long, she could not remember ever living in any other place. Long, long ago, there were other China Dolls. But one by one, some little girl had carried them away, and she was left alone. China Doll had black, painted hair, and big, staring eyes, and her lips and cheeks were very red. Her body was filled with sawdust, and her hands and arms to the elbow were china, as were her feet and legs to her knees. By and by, wax dolls came to the store. They had real hair, all curls, and eyes that would open and close, and poor China Doll was set back in the window and after a while she was put in a box on the shelf and taken out only once a year at christmas time when she was dusted and put in the window again she felt very lonely with so many stylish wax dolls and as she had given up hope of ever being chosen by any little girl she was glad when the little old lady who kept the store put her back in the box on the shelf at last there came a time when the children no longer came to the store but went to the big city for their toys, and China Doll and the little old storekeeper grew old together. China Doll sat in the window, all the time now, with tape and thread and other useful things, but was the only thing little folk could want. One day in summer, a tally-ho stopped in front of the store, and a party of young people came in. They bought a number of things and filled the old store with their laughter. Suddenly, the prettiest girl reached into the window and took out China Doll. Oh, you dear, quaint little doll, she said. My grandmother has one just like this, girls, and I have asked her many times to give it to me, to make a French pincushion, but she will not let me have it. Oh, how China Doll's heart beat. Could it be true that she was going at last? Yes, the pretty girl bought her and took her away on the tally-ho. The next day she dressed China Doll in the prettiest silk dress, such a one as she had dreamed of years ago, with an overskirt and pearled sleeves. Then she made her the dearest poke bonnet, trimmed with little roses. She also made her a pair of kid boots. When China Doll was all dressed, the prettiest girl put a ribbon over her arm, and on each end was a little bandbox. Then she stood China Doll on her dressing table and used the little boxes for pincushions. And there China Doll lived a very happy life, which teaches that all things come to those who wait. End of Little China Doll by Abby Phillips Walker The Milkmaid and Her Bucket from Fantastic Fables by Ambrose Bierce This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. 
The Milkmaid and Her Bucket by Ambrose Bierce A senator fell to musing as follows. With the money which I shall get for my vote in favor of the bill to subsidize cat ranches, I can buy a kit of burglar's tools and open a bank. The profit of that enterprise will enable me to obtain a long, low, black schooner, raise a death's head flag, and engage in commerce on the high seas. From my gains in that business, I can pay for the presidency, which, at fifty thousand a year, will give me in four years. But it took him so long to make the calculation that the bill for subsidizing cat ranches passed without his vote, and he was compelled to return to his constituents an honest man, tormented with a clean conscience. The End of The Milkmaid and Her Bucket by Ambrose Bierce The Poppies by Abbey Phillips Walker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Liam Cox. A long distance from here, in a far eastern country, there once lived a very rich king. All kings are not rich, you know, but this one was, and his jewels were the most beautiful ever seen. But this king dearly loved all the good things of this world, and gave feasts and dances that lasted for days without any one sleeping. Of course he could not lead such a life as that and have good health, and at last there came a time when the king could not sleep. At last he offered a reward to anyone who could put him to sleep no matter how it was accomplished. He said to the one who could do this he would give half his kingdom. The poor king was the subject of many experiments, and when he had almost given up hope of ever sleeping again, there came a strange-looking man to the gate of the castle. He wore a turban and a long flowing robe of white, and wore around his neck many chains and strings of queer-looking beads. "'I can make the king sleep,' he said. "'But I must be allowed to have the grounds of the castle to myself, "'and the king must obey me in every way.' "'The king was ready to do anything, "'and so the strange-looking man began his work. "'But before he would do anything for the king, "'he insisted upon having half the kingdom given into his hands. "'And when this was done, he set to work.' No one was allowed to be near him, and the king was left alone in the castle with him. One morning, not long after, the king saw what looked to be a sea of green all around the castle. But it really was a bed of green leaves, and soon there appeared white flowers among the leaves, and then the strange man told the king to walk among them. Soon the king felt a drowsy feeling stealing over him, and he sat down in the midst of the sea of green, and in a few minutes he was sound asleep. Then the strange man began to repeat something in a sing-song tone, and wave his hands over the sleeping king. He walked among the leaves and flowers repeating his queer rhyme, and the leaves and flowers grew taller and taller, until the king could not be seen, and the man moved away still chanting. Poppy, poppy, flower of sleep, your drowsy spell around him keep, for I can all his kingdom take if you do not let him wake. The poppies grew until they reached the top of the castle, and every one who went near to look for the king fell under the spell of their strange power until the people around gave it up and the strange man became king. He built a new castle, and the old one was forgotten. All went well with the new king, until a young man called at his castle and asked him about the old king, and the servants told him how the strange flowers had grown around the castle, and no one could go near, and that every one thought that the old king was dead. The new king, when he heard that the stranger was asking for the old king, had him driven from the castle. "'Tell your master!' said the stranger to the servants, that he will hear from me again. 
The stranger went into the woods where there lived an old witch, and at midnight they came out and went to the castle among the strange flowers. The witch held her hands high over her head and waved them up and down, saying all the time, Poppy, poppy, sleepy flower, now I have you in my power. I would have you sure to grow until the sleeping one you show. Down came the tall flowers and bushes until the young man cried out, Here he is! And then the flowers ceased to grow small. The witch knelt beside the sleeping king and whispered in his ear, Awake, good king, tis break of day, and drive the false king far away. The king opened his eyes and looked at the witch and the young man beside her. Oh, what has happened? he asked. I will leave you to tell him, said the witch. The sun is up and I must go. When you offered to give half your kingdom to the one who could make you sleep, said the young man, I set out for your castle with a box which contained a strange flower that had the power to make people sleep, but it had to be used with the greatest care, and I alone knew the secret of using it, for it was given to my grandmother by an old witch doctor. Before I could reach you, I was overtaken by a band of robbers and the box stolen. They made me tell what I intended doing with the flower on pain of death, but I did not tell the whole secret. Then they put me in a cave and rolled a stone in front of it, too heavy for me to move and left. I was almost dead from starvation when I was found by some peasants who nursed me until I was well enough to travel when I hurried here, only to find that one of the band of robbers had taken your whole kingdom after putting you to sleep with the charmed flower. He drove me from the castle when he heard that I was asking for you, and if it had not been for the witch who lives in the wood, I should not have been able to awaken you. She knew the secret, as she is the daughter of the witch who gave the flower to my grandmother. When the king heard the strange story, he hurried with the young man to the castle where the robber king lived. He was asleep when they arrived, and the servants who did not like their new master ran out to meet the old king, and when they heard what had happened, they went back to the castle and bound the robber while he slept, and when he woke, he was so frightened that he promised to tell where the rest of his band could be found if they would spare his life. This they promised to do, and the country was rid of these bad men, for they were put on a ship and made to work the rest of their lives. The king was so grateful to the young man who rescued him that he made him his heir, and when the king died, he left him his kingdom. End of The Poppies by Abbey Phillips Walker Recording by Liam Cox Nine Unlikely Tales by E. Nesbitt this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lola Janey. The Prince, Two Mice, and Some Kitchen Maids. When the prince was born, the queen said to the king, My dear, do be very, very careful about the invitations. You know what fairies are, they always come to the christening whether you invite them or not, and if you forget to invite one of them, she always makes herself so terribly unpleasant. My love, said the king, I will invite them all, and he took out his diamond-pointed pen and wrote out the cards on the spot. But just then a herald came in to bring news of war, so the king had to go off in a hurry. The invitations were sent out, but the christening had to be put off for a year. At the end of this time, the king had subdued all his enemies, so he was very pleased with himself. The prince was a year old, and he also was pleased with himself, as all good babies are, and found the little royal fingers and toes a fresh and ever delightful mystery. And the queen was pleased with herself, as all good mothers should be, so everything went merrily. The palace was hung with cloth of silver and strewn with fresh daisies in honor of the great day, and after all had eaten and drunk to their heart's content, the fairies came near with the gifts they had brought to their godson, the prince. 
he shall have beauty said the first and wit said the second and a pretty sweetheart said the third who loves him said the fourth and so they went on foretelling for him all sorts of happy and desirable things and as each fairy gave her gift she stooped and kissed the baby prince and then spreading her fine gossamer gauze wings fluttered away across the rosy garden the crowd of fairies grew less and less and there were only three left when the queen pulled the king's sleeve and whispered my dear where's malevola i sent her a card said the king casting an anxious look round him then it must have been lost on the way said the queen or she'd have been here she is here said a low voice in the queen's ear suddenly the room grew dark gray clouds hid the sun and all the daisies on the floor shut up quite close the poor queen gave a start and a scream and the king brave as he was turned pale for malevola was a terrible fairy and the dress she wore was not at all the things for a christening it was made of spiders webs matted together dark and dank with the damp of the tomb and the dust of dungeons her wings were the wings of a great bat spiders and newts crawled around her neck a serpent coiled about her waist and little snakes twisted and writhed in her straight black hair she looked at the queen so terribly that the poor mother majesty cried out without meaning to oh don't she cried and flung both arms around the cradle the prince was quite happy playing with his new coral and bells and looking at the palace cat who sat at the foot of the cradle washing herself now listen said malevola still speaking in the low even voice that was so terrible you did not invite me to the christening i've read my fairy tales and i know what's expected of a fairy who is left out on occasion like this i intend to curse your son then all the kings and queens who had come to the christening wished they had stayed away and they and all the courts fell on their knees and begged malevola for mercy as for the three good fairies who were left they hid behind the window curtains and the court ladies peeping between their fingers said fancy deserting their godson like this how unfairy-like but the queen and the king only wept and the prince played with his little rattle and looked at the cat then malevola said mockingly great king and mighty sovereign malevola was not good enough to be asked to your tea party but your family shall come down in the world your son shall marry a kitchen maid and marry a lady with four feet and no hands a shiver of horror ran through the room and malevola vanished then suddenly the sun came out and people lifted up their heads and dared again to look at each other and the daisies too opened their eyes again then the good fairies came out from behind the window curtains and the poor queen fell on her knees before them can't you do anything she asked can't you undo what she says and make it untrue not even a fairy can make a true thing untrue said the good fairies sadly malevola's words will come true but the prince has already many gifts and our gifts are yet to give and these you shall choose whatever you wish shall be his then the king recovering a little from the terror into which the fairy malevola had thrown him and remembering how well he and his royal line had always borne them in battle said at once let the boy be brave he is brave said one of the good fairies he fears nothing and at this the prince ceased to feel any fear of the palace cat he put out his hand and pulled her tail so merrily that pussy turned and clawed the little arm till the blood ran oh dear cried his mother he is fearless as you say i wish he were afraid of cats poor darling he is said the second fairy you have your wish 
and indeed the prince screamed and hid his face and shrank from the palace cat with such horror that the king pulled out his pencil and notebook and wrote an edict then and there banishing all cats from his dominions but all the same he was very angry your majesty has wasted one wish he said very politely to the queen let us now leave the last gift in the hands of the last fairy the last fairy came and kissed the prince who was now sobbing sleepily he shall be happy she said he shall have his heart's desire then she too vanished and the kings and queens took their leave when their gold coaches came for them and presently the king and queen were left alone with the silver hangings and the strewn daisies and baby oh dear oh dear said the queen this is dreadful a kitchen maid and a lady with four feet and no hands at least we are not likely to have a kitchen maid with less than two hands said the king we might arrange only to have titled kitchen maids said the queen timidly the very thing the king answered that would make the love affair all that one could wish but there's still the marriage of course he'll marry the lady he loves it's not the way of the world said the king at any rate let's hope he'll love the lady he marries otherwise otherwise what said the queen we know nothing about otherwise do we my queen he said catching her round the waist and in his love for his wife and his son the king felt almost happy again for here they were all three together and when your son is in his cradle his marriage seems very far off indeed but the queen was anxious and frightened and while the prince was still a child she sent messengers to the court of all the neighboring kings and queens to tell them what had been foretold which indeed most of them knew already having been at the christening and she begged such of them as had daughters to send them as kitchen maids that so the prince might at least fall in love with a real princess and as the prince grew up he was so handsome and so brave fearing nothing but cats which of course he never saw though he dreamed of them often and woke up screaming and also so brilliant and good that his father's kingdom being beyond compare the finest in all the world the young daughters of kings vied with each other as to who should find favor in the eyes of the queen mother and so get leave to serve in the kitchen each nursing the hope that some day the prince would see her and love her and perhaps even marry her and he was very good with all the noble kitchen maids but he loved none of them till one day he saw at a window of the tower where the kitchen was a bright face and bright hair tied round with a scarlet kerchief and as he looked at the face it was withdrawn but the prince had lost his heart he kept his secret safe in the place where his heart had been and schemed and plotted to see this fair lady again for when he went among the royal kitchen maids she was not there with them and he looked morning noon and evening but he never could see her so then he said i must watch o nights perhaps she's kept in prison in the tower above the kitchen and at night those who watch her may sleep and so i shall be able to talk to her so he dressed in dark clothes and hid in the shadow of the palace courtyard and watched all one night and he saw nothing but in the early morning when the setting moon and the rising sun were mixing their lights in the sky he heard a heavy bolt shot back and the door of the kitchen tower opened slowly the prince crouched behind the buttress and watched and he saw the fair maid with the bright hair under the red kerchief she swept the doorstep and she drew water from the well in the middle of the courtyard and presently he crept to the kitchen window and saw her light the fire and wash the dishes and make all neat and clean within and the prince's eyes followed her in all she did and the more he looked at her the more he loved her and at last he heard sounds as of folks stirring above so he crept away keeping close to the wall and so back to his own rooms and this he did again on the next morning and on the next 
and on the third morning as he stood looking through the window at the girl with the bright hair and the bright kerchief the gold chains he wore clinked against the stone of the window sill the maid started and the bowl she held dropped on the brick floor of the kitchen and broke in twenty pieces and then and there she sat down on the floor beside it and began to cry bitterly the prince ran in and knelt beside her don't cry dear he said i'll get you another bowl it isn't that she sobbed but now they'll send me away who will the noble kitchen maids they keep me to do the work because being king's daughters they don't know how to do anything but the queen doesn't know there's a real kitchen maid here and now you have found out they will send me away and she went on crying then you are a real kitchen maid and not noble at all said the prince she stopped crying for a minute to say no never mind said the prince you are twice as pretty as all the king's daughters put together and twenty times as dear at that she stopped crying for good and all and looked up at him from the floor where she sat yes you are he said and i love you with all my heart and with that he caught her in his arms and kissed her and the real kitchen maid laid her face against his and her heart beat wildly for she knew what the prince did not and what indeed all the folks knew except the prince that this had been foretold at his christening but she knew also that though he loved her he was not to marry her since it was dreadful destiny to marry someone with four feet and no hands i wish i had no hands and four feet said the real kitchen maid to herself i wouldn't mind a bit since it's me he loves what are you saying asked the prince i'm saying that you must go she said if their kitchen highnesses find you here with me they'll tear me into little pieces for they all love you to a highness and you he whispered how much do you love me oh she answered i love you better than my right hand and my left and the prince thought that a very strange answer he went through that day in a happy dream but he did not tell his dream to anyone lest some harm should come to the real kitchen maid for he meant to marry her and he had a feeling that his parents would not approve of the match now that night when the whole palace was asleep the real kitchen maid got up and crept out past the sleepy sentinel and went home to her father the farmer and got one of his great white cart horses and rode away through the woods to the cavern where the great white rat sits sleeplessly guarding the magic cat's eye and every one wondered why he guarded it so carefully for it seemed to have no great value but the great white rat watched it constantly without ever closing one of those round bright rat eyes of his and when folks sought to lay hands on it he said be careful it has the power to change you into a mouse on which folks dropped it hastily and went their ways leaving him still on guard to him now went the little kitchen maid and asked for help for he was thousands of years old and had more wisdom between his nose and ears than all the books in the world she told him all that had happened now what shall i do she said and the great white rat never shifting his eyes from the magic cat's eye answered keep your own counsel and be contented the prince loves you but said the real kitchen maid he's not to marry me but a horrible creature with four feet and no hands keep your secret and be content the great white rat repeated and if ever you see him in danger from a lady with four feet and no hands come straight to me so the real kitchen maid went back to the palace and set to work to clean pots and pans for now it was bright and dewy daylight and the night had gone and before the rest were awake again her prince came to her and vowed he loved her more than life so she kept her secret and was content at the time of the prince's christening the king had banished all cats from the kingdom because he could not bear to see his son show fear of anything but now and then strangers not knowing of the edict brought cats to that country and if the prince saw one of these cats he was taken with a trembling and a paleness standing like stone a while and presently with shrieks of terror fleeing the spot and it was now a long time since he had seen a cat 
Now, soon after the prince had found out how he loved the real kitchen maid, his father and mother died suddenly as they were sitting hand in hand, for they loved each other so much that it was not possible for either to stay here without the other. So then the prince wept bitterly and would not be comforted, and the court stood about him with a long face, wearing its new mourning. And as he sat there with his face hidden, something came through the palace gate and up the marble stairs and into the great hall where the prince sat on the steps of his father's throne, weeping. And before the courtiers could draw a breath or decide whether it was court etiquette for them to do anything while the prince was crying except to stand still and look sad, the creature came up to the prince and began to rub itself against his arm and he still hiding his face reached out his hand and stroked it then all the court drew a deep breath for they saw that the thing that had come in was a great black cat and the prince raised his eyes and they looked to see him shrink and shriek but instead he passed his hand over the black fur and said poor pussy then and at these words the whole court fled by window and door the courtiers took horse those who had carriages went away in them and those who had none went on foot and in less than a minute the prince and the cat were left alone together for the court was learned in witch law and knowing the prince's horror of cats saw it at once that a cat he was not afraid of was no cat at all but a witch in that shape therefore the courtiers and the whole royal household fled trembling and hid themselves all but the little real kitchen maid she saw with terror that the cat or rather the witch in cat shape had done what no one else could do roused the prince from his dull dream of grief and then she remembered the fate which malevola had foretold for him that he should marry a lady with four feet and no hands alack a day she cried this witch has four feet and no hands but she can have hands whenever she chooses and be a woman by her magic arts as easily as she can be a cat and then he will love her and what will become of me or worse she may marry him only to torment him she may shut him up in some enchanted dungeon far from the light of day such things have happened before now so she stood hidden by the blue auras and wrung her hands and the tears ran down her cheeks and all the time the black cat purred to the prince and the prince stroked the black cat and any one could have seen that he was every moment becoming more deeply bewitched and still the real kitchen maid crouched behind the arras and her heart ached that it knew no way to save him then suddenly she remembered the words of the great white rat if you ever see him in danger from a lady with four feet and no hands come straight to me now surely was the time for the prince she knew was in desperate danger the real kitchen maid crept silently down the marble stairs but once she was out of the palace she ran like the wind to the stable no men were about there all had followed the example of the court and had run away when they heard of the strange coming of the witch cat and all of the many horses that had stood in the stable only one remained for each man in his fright had saddled the first horse that came to hand and ridden off on it and the one that still stayed there was the prince's own black charger he had had no mind to be saddled in haste by a stranger and had turned and bitten the stranger who had attempted it so he was there alone now the little kitchen maid lifted the prince's gold broiled saddle from its perch and the weight of it was such that she could not have carried it but for the heavy heart she bore because of her love to the prince and his danger and that made all else seem light she put the saddle on the charger and the jeweled bridle and he neighed with pleasure for he understood being a horse who could see as far into a stone wall as most people and when he was saddled he knelt for her to mount and then up and away like the wind and she had no need to guide him with the reins for he found the way and kept it he galloped steadily on and the sun went down and the night grew dark 
And he went on and on and on without stumble or pause till at moonrise he halted before the house of the great white rat. Then, as the real kitchen maid sprang down, the great white rat came out from his house and spoke. You've come for it then. For what? The magic cat's eye. I've guarded it some thousands of years. I knew there would be a use for it at last. He may be saved yet if someone should love him well enough to die for him. I'll do that, said the little kitchen maid, and took the cat's eye in her hand. Swallow it said the white rat, and you'll turn it to a mouse. The little maid swallowed it at once, and behold, she was a little mouse. What am I to do, she asked. I can't tell you, said the great white rat, but love will tell you. So the little kitchen maid, in the form of the mouse, ran up one of the horse's legs and held tight onto the saddle with all her little claws. As the great horse galloped back towards the palace in the moonlight, she thought and thought, and at last she said to herself, The witch is in cat's shape, and she must have cat nature, so she will run after a mouse. She will run after me, and if I can lead her to a running stream, she will leap across it, and then she will have to take her own shape again. That must be what the great white rat meant me to do. And if the cat catches me, well, at least if I can't save my prince, I can die for him. And the thought warmed her heart as the great horse thundered on through the dawn light. When at last, creeping softly on little noiseless feet, the mouse kitchen maid re-entered the great hall. She saw that she was only just in time, for the black cat was purring and looking back at the prince as she walked, waving her black tail towards the further door of the hall. And the prince, more bewitched than ever, was slowly following her. Then the real kitchen maid mouse uttered a squeak and rushed across the porphyry floor, and the black cat, true to its cat nature, left purring at the prince and sprang after the mouse. And the mouse, at its best speed, made for the garden where ran the stream that fed the marble basins where the royal goldfish lived. The prince understood nothing save that the enchanting black furry creature was leaving him, and in an instant he was alone. He followed to the door and saw the cat springing along the passage down the stairs. He followed fast, then along another passage that passed the foot of the back stairs, and he saw that the back stairs were like a waterfall. Water was running down in a torrent and meandering away down the brick passage and out into the faint new sunshine. When the mouse saw this stream, she thought, I'm saved. She never thought of wondering how a stream came to be running down the back stairs of the palace. When she came to think of it afterwards, she always believed that the great white rat had managed it somehow. She never knew that it was really a great flood from the royal bathroom, where the royal housemaid, in her eagerness to run away from the witch, had left all the royal bath taps full on. The mouse bounded across the stream. The cat saw the danger, but she could not stop herself. She, too, crossed the stream, and as she crossed it, she turned into the wicked fairy Malevola, cobwebs, snakes, and newts and bat wings and all. The prince put his hand to his head like one awakening from sleep, and the horrible fairy vanished suddenly and forever. Then the mouse ran trembling to the prince, and in its thin little mouse's voice told him all. My love and my lady, he said, holding the mouse against his cheek, I will marry you now. That will carry out the wicked fairy's prophecy. Then we will go back to the great white rat, and you shall be changed into a princess. So the prince rang the church bells till all the people came out of their holes where they had been hiding to see the strange spectacle of a prince married to a mouse. And directly they were married, they set off on the black charger, and when they reached the great white rat, they told their tale. And now, said the prince joyously, if you will change her into a lady again, we will go home at once and begin living happily ever after. The great white rat looked at them gravely. It's impossible, he said. I am sorry, but the effects of the magic cat's eyes are permanent. 
Once a mouse, always a mouse. If you get moused by the magic cat's eye. The prince and the mouse looked sadly at each other. This was the last thing they had expected. The great white rat looked at them earnestly. Then he said, if it would be of any use to you, I've got another magic cat's eye. He held it out. The prince took it gladly. Kingdom and the life of a king were nothing to him compared with the love and happiness of a real kitchen maid disguised as a mouse. He put the stone to his lips. You know what'll happen if you do, said the great white rat. It, I'll change into a mouse and live happily ever after, said the prince gaily. Perhaps, said the great white rat. Nothing is impossible if people love each other enough. You mustn't, cried the mouse, trying to get between his lips and the cat's eye. My dear little real kitchen maid, said the prince tenderly, you have saved my life, and you are my life. I would rather be a mouse with you than a king without you. And with that he swallowed the cat's eye, and two small mice stood side by side before the great white rat. Very kindly he looked at them. Then he pulled a hair from his left whisker and laid it across their little brown backs. And on the instant there stood up a prince and a princess, and at their feet lay the little empty mouse skins. So the prince and his bride returned to the palace and lived happily ever after. They were as happy as if they had been mice, which, in a country where there are no cats, is saying a good deal. Of course, the prince is still afraid of cats, but the curious thing is that now his wife is afraid of them too. Perhaps she learnt that lesson when she was a mouse for his sake, when he was a mouse for hers, learned this lesson, which is also the moral of this story. Nothing is impossible if people only love each other enough. End of The Prince, Two Mice, and Some Kitchen Maids Recorded by Lola Jamie, October 2019. Reality by Charles Reed, read by Anne Fletcher, 2019. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reality Miss Sophia Jackson in the state of Illinois was a beautiful girl and had a devoted lover, Ephraim Slade, a merchant's clerk. Their attachment was sullenly permitted by Miss Jackson's parents, but not encouraged. They thought she might look higher. Sophia said, Why, la, he was handsome and good and loved her, and was not that enough? They said, No, to marry beauty a man ought to be rich. Well, said Sophie, he is on the way to it. He is in a merchant's office. It's a long road, for he is only a clerk. The above is a fair specimen of the dialogue, and conveys as faint an idea of it as specimens generally do. All this did not prevent Ephraim and Sophia from spending many happy hours together. But presently another figure came on the scene, Mr. Jonathan Clark. He took a fancy to Miss Jackson and told her parents so, and that she was the wife for him, if she was disengaged. They said, well, now, there was a young clerk after her, but the man was too poor to marry her. Now, Mr. Jonathan Clark was a wealthy speculator, so on that information he felt superior and courted her briskly. She complained to Ephraim, the idea of their encouraging that fat fool to think of me, said she, she called him old, though he was but thirty, and turned his person and sentiments into ridicule, though in the opinion of sensible people he was a comely man, full of good sense and sagacity. Mr. Clark paid her compliments. Miss Jackson laughed and reported them to Slade in a way to make him laugh too. Mr. Clark asked her to marry him. She said no, she was too young to think of that. She told Ephraim that she had flatly refused him. Mr. Clark made her presents. She refused the first and blushed, but was prevailed on to accept. She accepted the second and the third without first refusing them. She didn't trouble Ephraim Slade with any portion of this detail. She was afraid it might give him pain. 
clerk wooed her so warmly that ephraim got jealous and unhappy he remonstrated sophia cried and said it was all her parents fault forcing the man upon her clerk was there every day ephraim scolded sophia was cross they parted in anger sophia went home and snubbed clerk clerk laughed and said take your time he stuck there four hours she came round and was very civil matters progressed ephraim always unhappy clerk always jolly parents in the same mind clerk urged her to name the day never urged her again next year urged her again before her parents they put in their word oh sophie don't trifle any longer you're overdoing it there there do what you like with me said the girl i'm miserable and ran out crying clerk and parents laughed and stayed behind and settled the day when sophie found they had settled the day she sent for ephraim and told him with many tears oh said she you little know what i have suffered this six months oh my poor girl said ephraim let us elope and end it what oh, my parents would curse me oh they would forgive us in time oh never you don't know them oh no my poor ephraim we are unfortunate we can never be happy together we must bow i should die if this went on much longer you're a fickle faithless jade cried ephraim in agony oh god forgive you dear said she and wept silently then he tried to comfort her then she put her arm around his neck and assured him she yielded to constraint but her heart could never forget him she was more unhappy than he and always should be they parted with many tears on both sides and she married clark at her earnest request slade kept away from the ceremony by that means she was not compelled to wear the air of a victim but could fling the cloak of illusory happiness and gaiety over her aching heart and she did it too she was as gay a bride as had been seen for some years in those parts ephraim slade was very unhappy however after a bit he comprehended the character of sophia clark nay jackson and even imitated her she had gone in for money and so did he only on the square a detail she had omitted years went on he became a partner in the house instead of a clerk the girls set their caps at him but he didn't marry mrs clark observed this and secretly approved say she had married that was no reason why he should justice des femmes now you will observe that by all the laws of fiction mrs clark ought to have learned to her cost that money does not bring happiness and ought to have been miserable especially whenever she encountered the pale face of him whose love she valued too late well she broke all those laws and went in for life as it is she was happier than most wives her husband was kind but not doting a gentle master but no slave and she liked it she had two beautiful children and they helped fill her life her husband's gold smoothed her path and his manly affection strewed it with flowers she was not passionately devoted to him but still by the very laws of nature the wife was fonder of jonathan than the maid had ever been of ephraim not but what the latter remaining unmarried tickled her vanity and so completed her content she passed six years in clover and the clover in full bloom all the time nevertheless guilt happiness is apt to get a rub sooner or later clark had losses one upon the other and at last told her he was done for he must go back to california and make another fortune <sighs> lucky the old folks made me settle a good lump on you he said you're all right and the children away went stout-hearted clark and left his wife behind he knew the country and went at all in the ring and began to remake money fast his letters were not very frequent nor models of conjugal love but they had good qualities 
one was their contents a draught on new york some mischievous person reported that he was often seen about with the same lady but mrs clark did not believe that the remittances being regular but presently both letters and remittances ceased then she believed the worst and sent a bitter remonstrance she received no reply then she wrote a bitterer one and for the first time since their union cast ephraim slade in his teeth there he is said she unmarried to this day for my sake no reply even to this she went to her parents and told them how she was used they said they had foreseen it of that being a lie some people think it necessary to deliver themselves of before going seriously into any question and then after a few pros and cons they bade her observe that her old lover ephraim slade was a rich man a man unmarried evidently for her sake and if she was wise she would look that way and get rid of a mock husband who was probably either dead or false and in any case had deserted her but what am i to do said mrs clark affecting not to know what they were driving at why sue for a divorce divorce jonathan <gasps> think of it he is the father of my children and he was a good husband to me all the time he was with me it's all that nasty california and she began to cry the old people told her she must take people as they were not as they had been and it was no fault of hers nor california's if her husband was a changed man in short they pressed her hard to sue for a divorce and let slade know that she was going to do it but the woman was still handsome and under thirty and was not without a certain pride and delicacy that grace her sex even when they lack the more solid virtues no said she i will never go begging to any man i'll not let ephraim slade think i divorce my husband just to get him i'll part with jonathan since he has parted with me and after that i will take my chance ephraim slade he's not the only man in the world with eyes in his head so she sued for a divorce and got it quite easy divorce is beautifully easy in the west when she was free she had no longer any scruple about ephraim he lived at a town seven miles from her she had a friend in that town she paid her a visit she let the other lady into her plans and secured her cooperation mrs x set it abroad that mrs clark was a widow and from one to another ephraim slade was given to understand that a visit from him would be agreeable will it said ephraim then i'll go he called on her and was received with a sweet pensive tenderness sit down ephraim mr slade said she softly and tremulously and left the room she had scarcely cleared it when he heard her tell the female servant with a sharp imperious tone to admit no other visitors it did not seem the same voice she came back to him melodious the sight of you after so many years upset me said she and then after a pause and a sigh you look well <clears throat> oh yes i'm all right we are neither of us quite so young as we were you know oh no indeed with another sigh well dear friend i suppose you've heard i'm punished you see for my want of courage and fidelity i have always been punished but you couldn't know that perhaps after all you have been the happier of the two i'm sure i hope you have well i'll tell you mrs clark said he in open manly tones she stopped him oh please don't call me mrs clark when i have parted with the name for ever and sotto voce call me sophia well then sophia i'll tell you the truth when you jilted me who oh, and married oh who shall i say well then married another because he had got more money than i had no no oh ephraim it was all my parents but i will try to bear your reproaches go on 
"'Well, then, of course, I was awfully cut up. I was wild. I got a six-shooter to kill you and um, the other.' "'Oh, I wish you had,' said she. She didn't wish anything of the kind. Well, "'I'm very glad I didn't, then. I dropped the six-shooter and took to the moping and crying line.' "'Oh, poor Ephraim!' "'Oh, yes, I went through all the changes, and ended as other men do.' "'Oh, and how is that?' "'Why, by getting over it.' "'What? You've got over it?' "'Oh, Lord, yes, long ago.' "'Oh, indeed,' said she bitterly, and then with sly incredulity. Oh, "'How is it you've never married?' "'Well, I'll tell you. When I found out that money was everything with you girls, I calculated to go in for money, too. So I speculated like the other, and made money. But when I had once begun to taste money-making, somehow I left off troubling about women. Besides, I know a great many people, and I look coolly on, and what I see in every house has set me against marriage. Most of my married friends envy me and say so. I don't envy any one of them and don't pretend to. Marriage. It's a bad institution. You've got clear of it, I hear. All the better for you. I mean to take a shorter road. I won't ever get into it. This churl, then, who had drowned hot passion in the waves of time, and instead of nursing a passion for her all his days, had been hugging celibacy as man's choicest treasure, asked her coolly if there was anything he could do for her. Could he be of service in finding out investments, etc., or could he place either of the boys in the road to wealth? Instead of hating these poor children like a man, he seemed all the more inclined to serve them that their absent parent had secured him the sweets of celibacy. She was bursting with ire, but had the self-restraint to thank him, though very coldly, and to postpone all discussion of that kind to a future time. Then he shook hands with her and left her. She was wounded to the core. It would have been very hard to wound her heart as deeply as this interview wounded her pride. She sat down and shed tears of mortification. She was aroused from that condition by a letter in a well-known hand. She opened it all in a flutter. "'My dear Sophie, you're a nice wife you are. Here I have been slaving my life out for you, and shipwrecked, and nearly dead with a fever, and coming home rich again, and I asked you just to come from Chicago to New York to meet me, that have come all the way from China and San Francisco, and it's too much trouble. Did you ever hear of Lunham's dog that was so lazy he leaned against the wall to bark? It's very disheartening to a poor fellow that has played a man's part for you and the children. Now, be a good girl and meet me at Chicago tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. For if you don't, by thunder, I'll take the children and absquatulate with them to Paris or somewhere. I find the drafts on New York I sent from China have never been presented. Hmm, reckon by that you never got them. Has that raised your dander? Well, it's not my fault. So put on your bonnet and come and meet your affectionate husband, Jonathan Clark. I sent my first letter to your father's house. I send this to your friend, Mrs. X. Mrs. Clark read this in such a tumult of emotions that her mind couldn't settle a moment on one thing. But when she had read it, the blood in her beating veins began to run cold. What on earth should she do? Fall to the ground between two stools? No, that was a man's trick, and she was a woman every inch. She had not any time to lose, so she came to a rapid conclusion. Her acts will explain better than comments. She dressed, packed up one box, drove to the branch station, and got to Chicago. She bought an exquisite bonnet, took private apartments at a hotel, and employed an intelligent person to wait for her husband at the station and call out his name and give him a card on which was written Mrs. Jonathan Clark at the blank hotel. This done, she gave her mind entirely to the decoration of her person. The ancients, when they had done anything wrong and wanted to be forgiven, used to approach their judges with dishevelled hair and shabby clothes, sordidis vestibus. This poor shallow woman 
unenlightened by the wisdom of the ancients, thought the nicer a woman looked, the likelier a man would be to forgive her, no matter what. So she put on her best silk dress and her new French hat, bought on purpose, and made her hair very neat, and gave her face a wash and a rub that added colour. She did not rouge, because she calculated she should have to cry before the end of the play, and crying hard over rouge makes channels. When she was as nice as could be, she sat down to wait for her divorcee. She might be compared to a fair spider, which has spread her web to catch a wasp, but is sorely afraid that when he does come he will dash it all to ribbons. The time came and passed. An expected character is always as slow to come as a watched pot to boil. At last there was a murmur on the stairs, then a loud, hearty voice, and then a blow at the door. You couldn't call it a tap. And in burst Jonathan Clark, brown as a berry, beard a foot long, genial and loud, open heart, Californian manners. At the sight of her he gave a hearty, ah! and came at her with a rush to clasp her to his manly bosom, and knocked over a little cane chair, gilt. The lady, quaking internally and trembling from head to foot, received him like the awful Siddons, with one hand nobly extended, forbidding his profane advance. A word first, if you please, sir. Then Clark stood transfixed, with one foot advanced, and his arms in the air like Ixion when Juno turned to cloud. You have ordered me to come here, sir, and you have no longer any right to order me, but I am come, you see, to tell you my mind. What, do you really think a wife is to be deserted and abandoned, most likely for some other woman, and then be whistled back into her place like a dog? No man shall use me so. Why, what's the row? Has a mad dog bitten you, you cantankerous critter? Not a letter for ten months! That's the matter! cried Mrs. Clark, loud and aggressive. That's not my fault. I wrote three from China and sent you two drafts on New York. It's easy to say so. I don't believe it. Louder and aggressiver. And Clark, bawling in his turn. I don't care whether you believe it or not. Nobody but you calls Johnny Clark a liar. Mrs. Clark, competing in violence. I believe one thing, that you were seen all about San Francisco with a lady. Twas to her you directed my letters and drafts. That's how I lost them. It's always the husband that's in fault and not the post. Very amicably, all of a sudden. How long were you in California after you came back from China? Mm, two months. How often did you write in that time? Sharply. Well, you see, I was always expecting to start for home. You never wrote once. Very loud. Oh, well, that was the reason. That and the lady. Screaming loud. Oh, stuff. Give me a kiss and no more nonsense. Solemnly. That I shall never do again. Husbands must be taught not to trifle with their wives' affections in this cruel way. And tenderly. Oh, Jonathan, how could you abandon me? What could you expect? I'm not old. I am not ugly. Damn it all, if you've been playing any games, and he felt instinctively for a bowie knife. Oh, sir, said the lady in an awful tone that subjugated the monster directly. Well, then, said he sullenly, don't talk nonsense. Please remember we are man and wife. And Mrs. Clark, very gravely, Jonathan, we are not. Damnation, what do you mean? If you're going into a passion, I won't tell you anything. I hate to be frightened. Oh, what language the man has picked up in California. Well, that's neither here nor there. You go on. Well, Jonathan, you know I have always been under the influence of my parents. It was at their wish I married you. Well, that's not what you told me at the time. Oh, yes, I did, only you've forgotten. Well, when no word came from you for so many months, my parents were indignant, and they worked upon me so and pestered me so that... Oh, Jonathan, we're divorced. 
the actress thought that this was a good point to cry at and cried accordingly jonathan started at the announcement swore a heartful and then walked the room in rage and bitterness so then said he you leave the woman you love and the children whose smiles are your heaven you lead the life of a dog for them and when you come back by god the wife of your bosom has divorced you just because a letter or two miscarried oh that outweighs all you've done and suffered for her oh you're crying are you what you've given up facing it out and laying the blame on me have you oh yes dear i find you were not to blame it was my parents your parents well, you're not a child are you you are the parent of my children you little idiot have you forgotten that oh no oh, oh i have acted hastily i'm very very wrong oh come that's a good deal for a pretty woman to own there dry your eyes and let us order dinner what dine with you oh, damn it it's not the first time by a few thousand oh la jonathan i should like but i mustn't why not i should be compromised what with me oh yes with any gentleman oh, do try and realise the situation dear i'm a single woman good mr clark from california delivered a string of curses so rapidly that they all ran into what sir walter calls a clish maclava even as when the ringers clash and jangle the church bells mrs clark gave him time but as soon as he was in a state to listen quietly compelled him to realise her situation you see said she i am obliged to be very particular now delicacy demands it you remember poor ephraim slade your old sweetheart oh, confound him has he been after you again oh, why jonathan ask yourself he has remained unmarried ever since and when he heard i was free of course he entertained hopes but i kept him at a distance and so tenderly and regretfully i must you i am a single woman look me in the face sophie you won't dine with me oh i'd give the world but i mustn't dear not if i twist your neck round darling if you don't no dear you shall kill me if you please but i am a respectable woman and i will not brave the world but i know i've acted rashly foolishly ungratefully and i deserve to be killed oh kill me dear you'll forgive me then and with that she knelt down at his feet crossed her hands over his knees and looked up sweetly in his face with brimming eyes waiting yea even requesting to be killed he looked at her with glistening eyes you cunning hussy he said you know i wouldn't hurt a hair of your head what's to be done i tell you what it is sophie i've lived three years without a wife and that's enough i won't live any longer so no not a day it shall be you or somebody else oh, what's that a bell i'll ring and order one i've got lots of money they're always to be had for that you know oh jonathan don't talk so it's scandalous how can you get a wife all in a minute by ringing well if i can't then the town crier can i'll hire him for shame how is it to be then you that are so smart at dividing couples you don't seem to be very clever in bringing em together again it was my parents jonathan not me well dear i always think when people are in a difficulty the best thing is to go to some very good person for advice now the best people are the clergyman there's one in this street number eighteen perhaps he could advise us jonathan listened gravely for a little while before he saw what she was at but the moment he caught the idea so slyly conveyed he slapped his thigh and shouted out 
you are a sensible girl come on and he almost dragged her to the clergyman not but what he found time to order a good dinner in the hall as they went the clergyman was out but soon found he remarried them and they dined together man and wife they never mentioned grievances that night and jonathan said afterwards his second bridal was worth a dozen of his first for the first time she was a child and had to be courted uphill but the second time she was a woman and knew what to say to a fellow next day mr and mrs clark went over to the town they drove about in an open carriage for some hours and did a heap of shopping they passed by ephraim slade's place of business much oftener than there was any need and slower it was mrs clark who drove jonathan sat and took it easy she drives to this day and jonathan takes it easy end of reality by charles reed The Royal Picture of a Bed by John Leeton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare in County Antrim, Northern Ireland, situated in the northeast of the island of Ireland. The Royal Picture of a Bed. Poetical Preface to the Royal Picture of a Bed. To Precipitators. With learning may laughter be found. Tis good to be merry and wise, to gaily get over the ground, as higher and higher we rise. Some children their letters may learn, while others will surely do more, as the subjects suggestively turn to matters not thought of before. Descriptions and pictures combined are here made attractive and clear, so suited that children may find, from error, the truth to appear. A. Ablution. The Act of Cleansing. The little sweep has washed his face, but not as we advise. For black as soot, he's made the soup, and rubbed it in his eyes. B. Barter. Exchange. Here's Master Mac presenting fruit, of which he makes display. He knows he'll soon have Lucy's rope, and with it skip away. C. Catastrophe. A final event. Generally unhappy. But well, here's a sad catastrophe was mrs blossom's cry then water water bring to me or all my fish will die d delightful pleasant charming these boys are bathing in the stream when they should be at school the master's coming round to see who disregards his rule e eccentricity irregularity strangeness we often see things seeming strange but scarce so strange as this here everything is misapplied, here every change amiss. F. Fraud. Deceit, trick, artifice, cheat. Here is Pat Murphy, fast asleep, and there is Nettie Bray, the thief a watchful eye doth keep until he gets away. G. Genius. Mental power, faculty. A little boy with little slate may sometimes make more clear the little thoughts that he should state than can by words appear h horror terror dread this little harmless speckled frog seems lady townsend's dread i fear she'll run away and cry and hide her silly head i ichabod at the jam ichabod a christian name j jam a conserve of fruits enough is good excess is bad yet ichabod you see will with the jam his stomach cram until they disagree k knowing conscious intelligent the horses know both beans and corn and snuff them in the wind they also all know jemmy small and what he holds behind l lucky fortunate happy by chance we must admire in love books case the prompt decision made as he could not have gained the wood if time had been delayed m mimic imitative burlesque the gentleman who struts so fine unconscious seems to be of imitation by the boy who has the street door key n negligence heedlessness carelessness the character tom slow boy bears 
would much against him tell for any work that's wanted done or even play done well oh obstinacy stubbornness waywardness the obstinacy of the pig is nature as ye see but boys and girls who have a mind should never stubborn be p pets favourites spoilt fondlings some people say that aunt grey to animals is kind we think instead they are overfed and kept too much confined q quandary a doubt a difficulty dame partlets in difficulty and looks around with doubt let's hope as she some way got in she may some way get out r rivalry competition emulation in every competition prize they should be kept in view whoever wins should be the one who does deserve it too s sluggard an inactive lazy fellow to lie so many hours in bed you surely must be ill and need some physic master ned as birch or drought or pill t topsy-turvy upside down bottom top here's topsy-turvy upside down the ceiling seems the base reverse the ground and twill be found the things are out of place you uncommon vegetation uncommon rare not frequent v vegetation the power growth the uncommon vegetation here with art has much to do the trees are nature but the fruit uncommon and untrue w wonder admiration astonishment the wise may live and wonder still however much they know but simple guiles has wonder find within the penny show x no english word begins with this letter xantip a greek matron wife of socrates here's socrates and xantip philosopher and wife for gentleness renowned was he she better known for strife why yearn to grieve to vex miss cross has tried to reach the grapes she's tried and tried again and now she's vexed to think that all her efforts are in vain zed zanny a buffoon a merry andrew here's zanny reading a book with heels above his head and judging by his laughing look finds fun in what he's read end of the royal picture alphabet by john leeton An Untold Story by Thomas Bailey Aldrich. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anita Sloma Martinez. An Untold Story. The night was heavy, with the scents of flowers distilled in the dampness. A band was playing under a pavilion on the further side of the garden. Among the foliage hung hundreds of colored lights. The moon had risen, and in open spaces the overleaning sprays and branches were stamped in black on the asphalt walks, which, diverging right and left, led to fountains and cafes and secluded nooks. Here, after the heat of the day, the beauty and fashion of Budapest assemble for an hour or two to lounge and eat ices and get a breath of cool air. In the gay season, nearly every nation on earth contributes a costume or a singularity to the picturesque throng. Within a dozen paces of the little iron table where I was seated, the Danube swept by almost flush with the stone coping. At this point the current is very strong, running at a speed of not less than five or six miles an hour. The spring floods, fed by the snows and rains of the Blocksburg, must at times, I thought, test the strength of the buttresses of the airy bridges whose far-stretched threads of light were now repeating themselves in the water. A sultry summer night, with scarcely wind enough to stir a leaf on the topmost bough, and only now and then a hasty breath like a sigh from the river. The crowds of promenaders were gathered about the music stand, and I was virtually alone as I sat listening to the Strauss waltz and repeopling the height of the opposite shore with the hordes of turbaned Turks who stormed and took the place in 1526. Etched against the sky was a crumbling citadel, no longer solicitous of the straggling gray town that had crept up to it for protection. A sentinel fallen asleep ages and ages ago. 
From time to time a small boat glided across the broad strip of moonlight lying on the water and vanished. Suddenly a figure, the slender figure of a girl, rushed past me so closely that I felt the wind of the flying drapery. An instant afterward she had thrown herself into the Danube, a dark shape which the velocity of the current pressed against the masonry was carried twenty or thirty yards down the stream almost before I could spring to my feet. As I did so, a policeman, who seemed to rise out of the ground in the shadow of an acacia tree, leaned over the low curbing and clutched at the outspread skirt, which had not yet lost its buoyancy. A moment later two other guardians reached the spot, and the girl was lifted from the river, insensible, and lay glittering on the greensward. She was not more than eighteen or nineteen, a very beautiful girl, with the full delicate lines which distinguish the Slav women of even the peasant class. Her black hair hung in strands about the throat and face, the pallor of which was further intensified by the deep fringe of her eyelashes. On one half-bared shoulder, where it had probably grazed the brickwork, was a bruise. She wore a robe of some soft white material, plainly made, but in the fashion of the hour. A narrow scarlet ribbon, the bow of which had slipped under the ear, encircled her neck. A ring set with a single stone sparkled on the forefinger of the right hand. There were no other attempts of personal adornment. The simplicity of the girl's dress, with its certain negative evidences of refinement, left her grade in life indeterminate. She might have been a lady's maid, or a duchess. Beauty knows no distinction. The color had gone from the lips. They were slightly parted, as though she were smiling in her trance, if it was a trance. Could it be death? That seemed hardly probable under the circumstances, though so complex and delicate is the mechanism of the heart that a lighter shock than she had sustained may stop it. She had floated face downward, and there was some delay in lifting the body from the water, but not three minutes had elapsed between the desperate act and the rescue. By this time a number of persons had collected, and there were many gesticulations and much chattering in French, Italian, and Hungarian, the import of which I could not catch beyond an inference that the girl had been identified by one of the bystanders, a nondescript elderly person with glasses, who seemed in no especial manner afflicted by what had occurred, but was appreciative of his own accidental importance. Subsequently, I received the impression that the man found himself mistaken and had relapsed into nobody again. The lookers-on increased momentarily, drawn to the spot by some inscrutable instinct of sightseeing. One of the undreamed-of penalties of the suicide is to become spectacular. At the approach of a newcomer, a physician, the crowd respectfully drew aside, making place for him. His examination was of necessity superficial and preliminary. When it was ended, he rose from his knee, and without speaking spread a handkerchief over the face until then uncovered. The thin tissue adhered to the damp features and straightway molded itself into a startling mask. The doctor briefly interrogated the three guards, made a few memoranda on his tablets, and departed. A little distance off, their curiosity partly overcoming their fear, stood a group of children in an attitude of hesitation, ready for instant flight like a flock of timid sparrows. The physician's departure was the signal for renewed chattering and gesticulation, in which a helmeted Sergeant de Ville now joined, taking rapid notes and occasionally pausing to wave the book over his head, an energetic Sergeant de Ville. Then an interval of poignant silence ensued, Everybody waited. Presently, four men appeared with a litter, and the girl was laid upon it, looking like a marble statue carved on some medieval tomb, and was so borne away. The cortege had hardly disappeared down the main avenue when a gentleman, evidently a person of consequence, came hurriedly from an opposite direction, a footman in livery following closely at his heels. On learning which path the bearers had taken, the pair hastened after them. The crowd dispersed as quickly as it had gathered, and I went back to my seat under the trees. The river flowed on in the moonlight. Strains of music from the orchestra and sounds of happy voices, softened by distance, drifted through the shrubbery. The cafes were emptying, and the richly decked women and men in evening dress 
sauntered idly past. Nothing was changed in the mise-en-scene of half an hour before. All the fairy-like stage properties were the same. The effacement of the tragedy was so complete that the swift, dark interlude had scarcely left a sense of its incongruity. It was like a dream that one recalls confusedly on awakening. Did I imagine this thing a while ago as I sat drowsing in my chair with the untasted ice beside me? One tangible detail remained. The trampled greens were yonder where the body had lain, and the parapet splashed with water. The next morning I searched the papers, such at least as were printed in French, for some item touching the occurrence, but found none. How came it that the taste of life so soon turned bitter on those young lips? Was it some lover who scorned her, or one from whose love she fled? To the heart of what man, walking the thronged streets of the city, or dwelling alone in some adjacent suburb, did this piteous death send an intended pang? There was a kind of relief in knowing nothing more than I had witnessed. Perhaps the vague drama that pieced itself loosely together in my imagination was better than the reality would have been. A gloss of grim fact might have spoiled the finer text. As it was, the pathos and the mystery of it all haunted me and followed me across the sea. In the months that succeeded, the incident gradually faded out of my mind and probably would never have detached itself from the blur of half-forgotten things if chance had not again brought me to the Hungarian capital. As the Orient Express was nearing Budapest, the recollection of the girl who threw herself into the river two years before came abruptly into my thought and insisted on staying there. The reminiscence was natural enough, time and place considered, but the obstinacy of it irritated me a little. After dinner that evening, I joined the promenaders in the garden. The small iron table with its green-painted chair under the linden was in the same place and had quite the air of having kept itself unoccupied for me all this while. The river once more turned itself into silver and lapis lazuli as I looked. The military band was playing the old interminable waltz, and the same waiter took my order for an ice— it might have been the untasted ice of two years ago, refrozen. The thing that had happened seemed weirdly on the point of happening over again. Sitting there, I half expected a slender girlish figure to rush past me. At intervals, the remembered face glimmered among the shadows under the acacia trees, the face like a white rose drenched with rain. My halt at Budapest was of the briefest, a break in a long eastward journey to be resumed the following afternoon. As I was driving to the station the next day, a block in the crowded street brought my conveyance to a stand. Facing me on my right, and some eight or ten yards distant, was a landau wedged in a mass of carriages. The gold braid of the coachman and footman first caught my eye, then I glanced at the occupants of the carriage, a lady and a gentleman, and on them my gaze rested spellbound. It was the girl I had helped to drag from the river. The gentleman at her side and the footman on the box were the two men who had hurried into the garden that night just after the removal of the body. Excepting for them I might have discredited my eyes. I could not be mistaken in all three. It was she— pale as I remember her, but now with an aureole of distinction which she had not seemed to wear in her forlorner state. I had seen only her Slavonic beauty. She was simply robed as then, but now more richly, with a flash of diamonds at the wrist as she lifted one hand in a sudden imperious gesture to the driver of a vehicle behind her. There was, I fancied, something characteristic and temperamental in that gesture. I had only a moment for observation. The impeded stream of traffic flowed again, and the landau swept by, leaving a deepened mystery on my hands. Here was a more complex drama than I had sketched in my imagination two years previously. Then I had been content with the commonplace plot of some poor girl deserted by her lover. But now the play was not so simple as that— it involved subtler motive and action, and a different setting. There were new elements in the tragedy, and sharper contrasts to be considered. 
These two persons were evidently persons of rank. On the panels of the landau was a heraldic blazon, a clue if it had been possible for me to follow it. Who were they? Father and daughter, or husband and wife, or mistress and lover? I was not to know. I had caught a glimpse of one lurid page in the book of those two lives. Then the volume had been closed, and so far as I was concerned, sealed forever. That shut book, it stands darkling on a shelf by itself in my library, unread and never to be opened. In certain frequent moods, I find myself tantalized beyond reason by its conjectural romance. I have read many a famous novel which has not had for me one half the charm that lies in that untold story. End of an Untold Story by Thomas Bailey Aldrich Valiant Vicky, the Brie of Weaver by Flora Annie Steele. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare in County Antrim, Northern Ireland, situated in the northeast of the island of Ireland. Valiant Vicky, the Brie of Weaver. Once upon a time there lived a little weaver, by name Victor Prince. But because his head was big, his legs thin, and he was altogether small and weak and ridiculous, his neighbours called him Vicky, little Vicky the weaver. But despite his size, his thin legs, and his ridiculous appearance, Vicky was very valiant, and loved to talk for hours of his bravery, and the heroic acts he would perform if fate gave him an opportunity. Only fate did not, and in consequence, Vicky remained little Vicky the valiant weaver, who was laughed at by all for his boasting. Now one day, as Vicky was sitting at his loom, weaving, a mosquito settled on his left hand, just as he was throwing the shuttle from his right hand, and by chance, after gliding swiftly through, the, the shuttle came flying into his left hand, and on the very spot where the mosquito had settled, and squashed it. Seeing this, Vicky became desperately excited. It is as I have always said, he cried, if I only had the chance I knew, I could show my mettle. Now I'd like to know how many people could have done that. Killing a mosquito is easy, and throwing a shuttle is easy. But to do both at one time is a mighty different affair. It is easy enough to shoot a great hulking man. There is something to see, something to aim at. Then guns and crossbows are made for shooting. But to shoot a mosquito with a shuttle is quite another thing. That requires a man. The more he thought over the matter, the more elated he became over his skill and bravery, until he determined that he would no longer suffer himself to be called Vicky. No, now that he had shown his mettle, he would be called Victor. Victor Prince, or better still, Prince Victor. That was a name worthy his merits. But when he announced this determination to the neighbours, they roared with laughter and though some did call him Prince Victor, it was with such sniggering and giggling and mock reverence that the little man flew home in a rage. Here he met with no better reception, for his wife, a fine handsome young woman, who was tired to death by her ridiculous little husband's whims and fancies, sharply bade him hold his tongue and not make a fool of himself. Upon this, beside himself with pride and mortification, he seized her by the hair, and beat her most unmercifully. Then, resolving to stay no longer in a town where his merits were unrecognised, he bade her prepare some bread for a journey, and set about packing his bundle. I will go into the world, he said to himself. The man who can shoot a mosquito dead with a shuttle ought not to hide his light under a bushel. So off he set, with his bundle, his shuttle, and a loaf of bread tied up in a handkerchief. Now, as he journeyed, he came to a city, where a dreadful elephant came daily to make a meal of the inhabitants. Many mighty warriors had gone against it, but none had returned. On hearing this, the valiant little weaver thought to himself, Now is my chance. A great haystack of an elephant will be a fine mark to a man who has shot a mosquito with a shuttle. So he went to the king and announced that he proposed single-handed to meet and slay the elephant. At first the king thought the little man was mad, 
but as he persisted in his words he told him that he was free to try his luck if he chose to run the risk adding that many better men had than he had failed nevertheless our brave weaver was nothing daunted he even refused to take either sword or bow but strutted out to meet the elephant armed only with a shuttle it is a weapon i thoroughly understand good people he replied boastfully to those who urged him to choose some more deadly arm and it has done its work in its time i can tell you it was a beautiful sight to see little vicky swaggering out to meet his enemy while the townsfolk flocked to the walls to witness the fight never was such a valiant weaver till the elephant descrying its tiny antagonist trumpeted fiercely and charged right at him and then alas all the little man's courage disappeared and forgetting his new name prince victor he dropped his bundle his shuttle and his bread and bolted away as fast as vicky's legs could carry him now it so happened that his wife had made the bread ever so sweet and had put all sorts of tasty spices in it because she wanted to hide the flavour of the poison she had put in it also for she was a wicked revengeful woman who wanted to be rid of her tiresome whimsical little husband and so as the elephant charged past it smelt the delicious spices and catching up the bread with its long trunk gobbled it up without stopping an instant meanwhile fear lent speed to vicky's short legs but though he ran like a hare the elephant soon overtook him in vain he doubled and doubled and the beast's hot breath was on him when in sheer desperation he turned hoping to bolt through the enormous creature's legs being half blind with fear however he ran full tilt against them instead now as luck would have it at that very moment the poison took effect and the elephant fell to the ground stone dead when the spectators saw the monster fall they could scarcely believe their eyes but their astonishment was greater still when running up to the scene of action they found valiant vicky seated in triumph on the elephant's head calmly mobbing his face with his handkerchief i had to pretend to run away he explained or the card would never have engaged me then i gave him a little push and he fell down as you see elephants are big beasts but they have no strength to speak of the good folks were amazed at the careless way in which valiant vicky spoke of his achievement and as they had been too far off to see very distinctly what had occurred they went and told the king that the little weaver was just a fearful wee man and had knocked over the elephant like a ninepin then the king said to himself none of my warriors and wrestlers no not even the heroes of old could have done this i must secure this little man's services if i can so he asked vicky why he was wandering around the world for pleasure for service or for conquest returned valiant vicky laying such stress on the last word that the king in a great hurry made him commander-in-chief of his whole army for fear he should take service elsewhere so there was valiant vicky a mighty fine warrior and as proud as a peacock of having fulfilled his own predictions i knew it he would say to himself when he was dressed out in full fig with shining armour and waving plumes and spears swords and shields i felt i had it in me now after some time a terribly savage tiger came ravaging the country and at last the city folk petitioned that the mighty prince victor might be sent out to destroy it so out he went at the head of his army for he was a great man now and had quite forgotten all about limbs and shuttles but first he made the king promise his daughter in marriage as a reward nothing for nothing said the astute little weaver to himself and when the promise was given he went out as gay as a lark do not distress yourselves good people he said to those who flocked round him praying for his successful return it is ridiculous to suppose the tiger will have a chance why i knocked over an elephant with my little finger i am really invincible but alas for our valiant vicky no sooner did he see the tiger lashing its tail and charging down on him than he ran for the nearest tree and scrambled into the branches there he sat like a monkey while the tiger glowered at him from below of course when the army saw their commander-in-chief bolt like a mouse they followed his example and never stopped until they reached the city where they spread the news that the little hero had fled up a tree there let him stay said the king secretly relieved 
for he was jealous of the little weaver's prowess and did not want him for a son-in-law meanwhile valiant vicky sat cowering in the tree while the tiger occupied itself below with sharpening its teeth and claws and curling its whiskers till poor vicky nearly tumbled into its jaws with fright so one day two days three days six days passed by on the seventh the tiger was fiercer hungrier and more watchful than ever as for the poor little weaver he was so hungry that his hunger made him brave and he determined to try and slip past his enemy during its midday snooze he crept stealthily down inch by inch till his foot was within a yard of the ground and then why then the tiger which had had one eye open all the time jumped up with a roar valiant vicky shrieked with fear and making a tremendous effort swung himself into a branch cocking his little bandy legs over it to keep them out of reach for the tiger's red panting mouth and gleaming white teeth were within half an inch of his toes in doing so his dagger fell out of its sheath and went pop into the tiger's wide open mouth and thus point foremost down into its stomach so that it died valiant vicky could scarcely believe his good fortune but after prudding at the body with a branch and finding it did not move he concluded the tiger really was dead and ventured down then he cut off its head and went home in triumph to the king you and your warriors are a nice set of cowards said he wrathfully here have i been fighting that tiger for seven days and seven nights without bite or sup whilst you have been guzzling and snoozing at home pah it's disgusting but i suppose every one is not a hero as i am so prince victor married the king's daughter and was a greater man than ever but by and by a neighbouring prince who bore a grudge against the king came with a huge army and encamped outside the city swearing to put every man woman and child within it to the sword hearing this the inhabitants of course cried with one accord prince victor prince victor to the rescue so the valiant little weaver was ordered by the king to go out and destroy the invading army after which he was to receive half the kingdom as a reward now valiant vicky with all his boasting was no fool and he said to himself this is a very different affair from the others a man may kill a mosquito an elephant and a tiger yet another man may kill him and here is not one man but thousands no no what is the use of half a kingdom if you haven't a head on your shoulders under the circumstances i prefer not to be a hero so in the dead of night he bade his wife rise pack up her golden dishes and follow him not that you will want the golden dishes at my house he explained boastfully for i have heaps and heaps but on the journey these will be useful then he crept outside the city followed by his wife carrying the bundle and began to steal through the enemy's camp just as they were in the middle of it a big cockchafer flew into valiant vicky's face run run he shrieked to his wife in a tremble taking and setting off as fast as he could never stopped till he had reached his room again and hidden under the bed his wife set off at a run likewise dropping her bundle of golden dishes with a clang the noise roused the enemy who thinking they were attacked flew to arms but being half asleep and the night being pitch dark they could not distinguish friend from foe and falling on each other fought with such fury that by next morning not one was left alive and then as may be imagined great were the rejoicings at prince victor's prowess it was a mere trifle remarked the valiant little gentleman modestly when a man can shoot a mosquito with a shuttle everything else is child's play so he received half the kingdom and ruled it with great dignity refusing ever afterwards to fight saying truly that kings never fought themselves but paid others to fight for them thus he lived in peace and when he died every one said valiant vicky was the greatest hero the world had ever seen End of Valiant Vicky, The Brave Weaver by Flora Annie Steele